This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 1632, Off the Racks, a Cornucopia of Comics Conversation 2016. I'm Adam Murdo. I'm Shane Kelly. I'm Chris Everly. And I'm Brian Deemer. Speak! <laughs> Speak. Yeah. Okay, welcome to Comic Geek Speak. Um, here we are. It's uh, post-Thanksgiving week. We're all just uh, glowing with the, uh, the uh, post-consumption <laughs> enjoyment here, and we're just... <laughs> The turkey coma. <laughs> yeah, g- gathering around the CGS family table now to indulge in a different kind of feast. Yeah. We're just going to gorge ourselves on some uh, recent comic release talk. Talking about magnificent. S- yep, this is our chance to catch up on a couple of months worth of off the rack picks. We got six of them uh, lined up here, plus whatever else we've uh, read recently that uh, we feel like talking about, as per usual. But it's just uh, same story, just a greater volume. Yeah, yeah just a. <laughs> Give thanks for all the good stuff we've had to read lately, I guess. Okay, but first of all, the first uh, thanks we must give is thanks to our sponsor for this episode, which happens to be the Collection Drawer Company, maker of the Drawer Box Comic Storage System, the easy access storage solution. You can get all the details about their fine products at collectiondrawer.com. And their flagship product is, of course, the Drawer Box, which is a twist on the traditional comics cardboard long box storage unit. Um... Uh, designed in such a way that comics are accessible at all times from this box. Even when you've got uh, boxes stacked on top of one another, you can get at them without having to move boxes around because you get at them through a pull-out drawer built into the front of the box rather than through a lid that lifts off the top. Each box is designed to be stackable. It can support up to five boxes filled with comics on top of it without collapsing. Uh, the boxes will even support the other boxes if the bottom drawer is completely removed. They're that sturdy. The ends are reinforced with four layers of cardboard so they withstand pulling, unlike regular boxes. And there's even handles at either end to make them more portable. And they come in a variety of sizes and shapes, so they can be used to store uh, magazines, sewing supplies, LP records, action figures, all kinds of stuff, not just your standard comic book. Um, Plus, they also sell accessories such as the uh, Box Locks Anchors, which makes it even easier to stack the boxes higher so that there's no box tipping and there's improved stability. And there's also the Box Sort Upright Dividers, which help to keep the contents within your drawer boxes upright. It prevents spine cracking and it uh, makes it easier to uh, partition your boxes uh, just for different uh, sections of your collection. So all these fine products can be uh, learned more about and ordered from CollectionDrawer.com, home of the Collection Drawer Company, one of our oldest and steadiest sponsors, and we thank them for their support. Here, here. I, I actually had a great uh, drawer box experience recently. So on Easter, we went to uh, a friend's apartment in Philly. Right? It's not a big apartment like most apartments in Philly. And uh, <clears throat> my buddy, he's, he's like a year older than me. And he used to collect comics back in the early 90s. And uh, so he's got some really good stuff, like original Sandman run, all kinds of that kind of stuff, right? And uh, he's got a handful of long boxes shoved in his, like, under, like behind his bed or something, like in a closet, and he can't access them, of course. It's the same standard thing. He has to unstack them. He's got other stuff on top of them because there's no room in his tiny apartment. And I told him about drawer boxes, and he messaged me about a month ago. He's like, I just ordered my drawer boxes. I'm so excited. He's like, they're wonderful. I was like, he's like, it changes everything. There you go. <laughs> and we should acknowledge the fact that we're reveling that our glorious founder has returned mm-hmm. to join us. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is why I only come on like once every six months because then I get this grand announcement and, and it makes me feel much better about myself. Hoorah, <laughs> hoorah. <laughs> See, always make it an event. <laughs> exactly. If I'm here every week, everybody will be bored. Well, nonsense, my friend, but we're always honored to have you. <laughs> All right. Now, Mr. Demer, did you want to talk, before we get to the books, did you want to talk about some general things you're reading since you don't have the full time to join us, or what would you prefer? Yeah, I can talk about some, some books I'm reading, some general, Please do. Geek, some nice. general geeky stuff that I'm into. So I don't know if you guys saw, but I got a 3D printer. Oh, my God, did I love what you were showing some pictures of that stuff. That's incredible. It's 
it's like the coolest thing ever, <laughs> ever. I th- it's I thought of you yesterday. I saw somebody released like three hundred D and D miniatures for free that you could download and print. And I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, the the printing of miniatures is still a little like I'm not. The resolution of the machine is not good enough for the the quality of miniatures that I want to paint. Right, mm-hmm. I, it's. That's like my biggest thing now is I'm way, way, way into this miniature painting thing, and I'm just trying to get better and better and better. And so I, the, the better the miniature is, the more fun it is to paint because the crisp detail is there. So the 3D printers can't quite do the detail that I, I want to enjoy, so I'm just going to wait on that. But for terrain, for for playing D&D, I guess none of you guys have really ever played D&D, right? I used to. Uh- I did buy a volume of the newest version in the hopes that i get to sit down and read it and kind of teach the kids how to play it a little bit i just haven't so, to do it yet so they have this there's all these um dungeon tiles that are coming out um that you can print and then uh pardon my noise here for a second and then so so there are these like a tile right it's a it's a little like two inch by two inch tile right this is a piece of wall with a, a floor on it and then there's like I got three of them here clipped together with walls and floor, and then you can just clip these together and make these huge dungeon rooms, so that as you like march your miniatures in, instead of just playing with a little map, you can play in three dimensional, yeah. right? When you move your miniatures around, and and you can these just clip apart, and each one is like is like twenty five cents worth of plastic, oh so it's super cheap. Wow. And I quickly painted them and just with real quick dry brushing. So each tile takes like, I don't know, less than a minute to paint or so. And uh, and then you just crank them out and it's it's like completely changing the way you experience D&D. And the printer that I bought was only 200 bucks. Wow. So printing these out at 25 cents a pop like pays for itself in short order if you're a big gamer. Yeah. And so it's it's just so incredibly awesome. And- I and when you I'm play, having too much fun. When you play the game and you make the map, you you start with tiles and you add to as the map goes, as the game goes on, or do you start with the whole thing? No, you generally reveal it like one room yeah, at a time. And so awesome. what's cool about these with these clips is that you can pre-assemble it like, you know, in a in a cardboard box, hide it from your players, yeah. and then you're like, okay, you open the door, and then you pull out the next room and then clip it on, and then boom, they see the whole map unfolding. And because it's cheap, you can print all the tiles you need for the whole huge dungeon without like, oh, by the time I get to the third room, I have to steal from the first room. It's like, no, oh, just yeah. keep printing, make more, right? Like just, and then you can have a whole huge dungeon all laid out. It's just, it's so, it's so cool. That's awesome. It's like amazing. I can't imagine yeah, if we'd had that when we were kids. Oh my God. Yeah. It's, it, it, everything is different now. And then you combine this with the, with the miniature painting stuff and I'm just having way too much fun. I actually got, um, I paint all the Warhammer miniatures, mm-hmm. and uh, the one that I most recently finished, they're actually going to print pictures of it in the next issue of the Warhammer magazine because they liked my paint job so much. That's awesome. So like now I have to up my game even more, and like, okay, well, that's that's good motivation for getting better and better, right? Did they notify you that they were going to put it in a certain issue? Well, I don't know which issue, but they but they said, uh, you know, the guy contacted me and said, we love those pictures. Can you take better pictures? And then I took better pictures, and they're like, okay, those are good. We can print those. And so, you know, that's all I know. But oh God, so we'll great. see. That's cool. So I, I, it'll probably be issue five of White Dwarf, the new the new uh, version of White Dwarf. So that's awesome. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's cool because it's art, right? Like I get to, I couldn't make comics. I couldn't write comics. I, could, I didn't, you know, like. But I can paint miniatures, and I'm yeah. learning all kinds of cool physical techniques, and then color theory, and all kinds of neat stuff. So it's it's uh, been a lot of fun. And even well, the last... my friend, to be fair, you did make a comic many years ago. Well, I published a comic. I didn't yes. make it, right? You know, there's uh, a big difference, right? I coordinate. <laughs> I I wrangled the people to get it done. I didn't actually do it myself, right? And you are an outstanding wrangler, sir. Yeah. Although I did do the lettering. It was you know. Com- lettering on the computer and then print it out and on sticky stuff and then I had to cut with scissors around all the balloons yeah, and then stick them to the page. Oh god, it took forever. I'll tell you, yeah. I miss original art with that kind of stuff on it. Yeah, it, well, it is cool looking at old pages that have the word balloons on it. Oh, yes. There's a lot more flavor to the page. Yeah. Absolutely. 
So what am I? Oh, did everybody get their Rogue One tickets? Yes, I did. Oh, yes. I might get to see yep. it Thursday night, and I bought my ticket for Sunday. There's nice. a there's a work event that somebody is sponsoring that I might get in for whatever they're doing, and I'm like, oh my god, I'll take anything. I can't wait. I was up, I was up at five forty five on Monday, and the Thursday night tickets for the seven o'clock show they didn't have any good seats left. Yeah. And there was not, there were seats for the nine o'clock, but then the girls would we would all be up to like almost midnight, and it's like that's too late for a school night. So we're going four thirty in the afternoon on Friday. So that's awesome. That's that's not too bad. I'll just stay off of Facebook on Friday, and I'll be fine. Right? I'm I'm well, off on ahead, Friday, and I was going to try and go. Um, it's my dad's birthday, as well as stuff I have to get done around the house, and I could not figure out a good block to do it. So I bowed out and just went with my normal Sunday morning, ten a.m going to see it whenever i can with the kids so I'm, i'll still have a great time even if i don't get to see it thursday i'll still be excited sunday morning but yeah i'll probably stay away from the internet for friday and saturday good idea <laughs> once again ryan never failed he secured his tickets for the thursday night showing at seven at the r mall which has uh the in-service uh food and popcorn and the whole nine yards and the comfy chairs so i look forward to our review of the movie after we've all seen it yeah yeah, I'll probably get to a late show sometime the following week. You know, work is difficult right now, yeah. uh, but I'm but I'm in no hurry. I uh, I I really think this has the potential to be so great. It, everything about it just looks fantastic. Yeah, it sure does. I'm super stoked. Yeah. So as far as what I'm reading, uh, I'm still reading the Jason Aaron Thor, oh, which is very very good. Outstanding. Um. Doctor Strange is still amazing. Uh, uh, I started reading. I tried the first issue of Reborn, the Mark Miller image book. That was I have it. I haven't read it yet. It was a good. I haven't read it yet. Yeah, I liked it. And I also read the first issue of something to eternity or something of eternity. Like what? Uh, it's another. So the Rick Remender series. Yes. Yeah. What's it called? Seven to Eternity. Seven to Eternity. Yeah. 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 That. That's uh, that first issue was pretty good. I have the second issue sitting there waiting for me, so I'm going to get dig into that soon. Um, what else did I read? Uh, I, uh, I first issue of Champions was good. Oh, good! Mark I haven't Wade read that yet. Doing great stuff. I'm looking forward to that. Um, and and of course the all new Avengers, all new all different Avengers yeah. by Mark Wade, which is mostly the champion half the champions people doing. It, that's that was a great that's a great book, which is why I was looking forward to Champions, and so. Really, really enjoyed that. I was re- I'm reading the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that Dave Wachter drew. Oh, right, right. Oh. And you know, I mean, I haven't read TMNT for you know 20 years or whatever, but it's 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 great. You know, it's it's fun and his artwork is beautiful, of course. So yeah. that's kind of cool. Um, what else? I'm reading. Have um, you read the Vision, my friend? No, I still haven't read it oh, yet. Okay. I, I I have the first six issues read. I have the others to do yet. Fabulous. I I'm blown away. Oh yes, yeah. I'm still enjoying Daredevil. That's still cool. Um, what else? I mean, I mean, I'm reading quite a bit of stuff. I read the first issue of Teen Titans. That was pretty good. Of of Teen Titans or Titans? Teen Titans. Okay. All right. <clears throat> With Damien and okay. uh, and crew, uh, Clara read it and she said she loved it. So that's cool. Excellent. Um, the Spider-Man book, just the no adjective Spider-Man is very good. Um, that's the, the Bendis book with Miles Morales and stuff. That's, I, I quite enjoy that. Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm reading a bunch of stuff and did it's you, all like all the Marvel stuff that I'm reading is very good. Did you delve into any of the Star Wars stuff from Marvel? Yeah. Star Wars is awesome. Oh yes. Uh, they can do no wrong with that. The the Darth Vader series was actually pretty good. Yeah, I love that series. Oh. Um, the uh, the Poe Dameron book so far is good. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. Know? Yep. Like they're they're. I love that they finally. You know, there were so many years that, other than the occasional you know mini series or few issue run by some creative team, Star Wars, all the Star Wars comics were always sort of like B quality. It just wasn't anything to really be super excited about. But now it's like now they're finally treating it with the respect that I feel it deserves and getting A-list creators yeah. doing A-list work on a serious property that we all know and love. And it's wonderful. Like why did it take so long to get 
this well, many consistently good Star Wars books. And, and I think well, Dark, sorry, Horse did, Dark Horse did a lot of good things, but the best that they ever did, I, I thought, was that last Star Wars series just before they lost the license. Oh, by Brian Wood. It was by amazing. By Brian Wood. That was yeah. fabulous. And, and I was really um, hesitant and skeptical about what Marvel would do with it, but I have been just blown away with everything they've done for that property. Been very and to happy. be fair to, to – I'm sorry, Shane. Go ahead. No, no. You're fine. Go. To be fair to Dark Horse, and I know what Brian's talking about because they did, they did so many different series with that property. And as always the case, when you have that much output, you know a lot of it's going to be, be mediocre or forgettable. Um, but there were series, I recall Empires especially – um, and the Brian Wood series you mentioned, some, and some of the various miniseries that were outstanding, as good as I think anything Marvel's done. But again, there was so much there that yeah. you really had to kind of pick and choose and find your way between what was coming out. And Brian makes a good point. You know, they had some excellent creators, but a lot of them, you know, were just kind of B list type creators. So here with Marvel, because it's so laser beam focused, no pun intended. I mean, I agree with you, Brian. You're get you're getting top flight creators who. Clearly, are having a ball. I mean, these are clearly all creators who are major fans of the property, and they're right. just having so much fun. Like the Han Solo miniseries is a hoot and a half. That's a really yeah. good time. Um, and and they they just they just understand the characters so well, and they they get they get they uh, capture their voices. The Aaron Star Wars book is amazing. Uh, I can't emphasize enough his vision on that and how consistent it is, and how he just captured like the, the Han and Leia interactions in that are tremendous. Yeah. He really has it down beautifully. Well, and and, and so. in the main Star Wars book, I love the times past esque Obi Wan stories oh. that come out every mm-hmm. now and then. It, the first please one that make happened, that a movie for Pete's oh, sake. Okay. Come on. The, the first issue that came out of that, yeah. and I'm reading through it, I'm thinking, oh my god, this is as good as Starman's time past stories that would happen. I it would it it just floored me. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I'm also I'm reading the uh, the Star Wars novel, the second. Um, so last year, Aftermath came yes. out. It was the first novel. So yes. I'm reading the second part of that trilogy. Okay. And uh, that's pretty good. Um, actually, it's, it's much better, I think, than, than Aftermath was. I can't remember what it's called. I don't know if you remember, I, Shane. But. I don't remember what it's called, but I was hesitant to pick that second one up because I was not as impressed with the first one. Yeah, the, the second one is much better. Okay. Um, and then I also started just today listening to the audiobook of Catalyst, which is the Rogue One story. Mm-hmm. So I read some things that are like, there's a lot of cool stuff in this because it's like the precursor to Rogue One. They're like, you want to read this before you see the movie because you'll get all, you'll pick up all kinds of little things that'll okay. be in the movie that you would otherwise not realize. So I'm, you know, racing through the audiobook trying to, you know, beat the clock on the release of the movie. I might have to look for look at that for the audiobook. Um I I put it on what not not like I have a Christmas list, but I did put it on as something if the kids are currently want to get something, get me that book cuz that one sound I read the dust jacket on it and it sounded really interesting. Um but I know I won't get it done before the movie, but maybe the audiobook yeah. I can delve through. The only problem is these Star Wars books, they can't just do an audiobook. They're, they're finally doing unabridged. For years, they did abridged versions, and like all the new Jedi Order, like each book would be like four hours long. It's like well, that's ridiculous. But so they're finally doing unabridged, but they insist on putting like sound effects and music and stuff, and then you can't focus on the what the person's reading because you're listening to Tie Fighters or lightsabers <laughs> or whatever, and you're like. Audiobooks are very simple. A guy talks into a microphone for eleven hours, and then he's done. Stop with you don't have to do any post production nonsense with editing in sounds. It just makes it hard to listen to. It's so maddening. For, for me, it depends <laughs> on what the book is about. I I prefer it if I I don't like sound effects and all that stuff. If it's just one person reading the book, if it is a full audio cast of characters, then I prefer to have the post production kind of stuff in there. But again, it depends on the story. If it's something that I I'm interested in and, and really want in a certain way. I'm okay with that, but I, I agree with you. If it's if it's just one guy reading and all I want to do is get through the book, I don't want the rest of that stuff. Yeah, it's very distracting. Yeah. <laughs> Should we move on to Doom Patrol, my friend? Sure, sure. Okay, first question: Did anybody peel off the sticker? I did not. I didn't dare. No, oh, I, actually, I, didn't, I didn't do it either. I didn't I, even realize it. I tried, but it. it like didn't want to i thought maybe if it would come up real easily i would sort of peek but yeah. it's like i was trying to grip it and it was like 
wrecking it, so I'm like, ah, eh, forget it. And, and the, the girls were like, you gotta peel it, you gotta peel it. It's not like I keep my books in pristine condition anymore. I mean, I do keep them nice, and I still bag and board, but I'm not as careful as I once was with every single issue. So I wasn't opposed to it, but yeah, it, it wasn't the easiest thing to start, and I just gave up without wrecking the book or ripping it. Plus, I don't like my pet peeve. First of all, I don't like white covers at all, and this being such a huge white cover just drives me insane. All right, do we want to? Do we have a solicitation to read, or we just want to plunge into our rating? Or oh my, you know, I'm sorry, Chris, I did not even think about that. It was... Yeah, well, I actually, I think I probably recycled my previews from that month a long time ago, so I wouldn't have been able to. I did too. That's all right. But <laughs> one thing we probably should do, though, is just go ahead and uh, the, reel off the, the titles of all the different comics we're going to be talking go about here. Go for it. All right, so we're going to begin with the new Doom Patrol number one you know, from uh, DC's new young animal imprint, you know, Gerard uh, Way's brainchild. We're also going to do uh, Doctor Strange Annual number one from Marvel and from IDW, Mask, Mobile Armored Strike Command. Colon, Revolution, number one. Uh, these are all from, uh, uh, from September. And then from the month of October, we've got three more uh, from DC, Batman Beyond, number one. Uh, from Marvel, Jessica Jones, number one. And from Image, Moonshine, number one. So those are the big six for this episode. All right. Let's give our initial ratings, and then we'll go do commentary. Where about you start? Okay. I give it kind of a low buy. I give it a borrow. This is tough for me. Very, very, very low borrow. Wow, low borrow. Yep. I, so I, I sort of have two. For me personally, it's maybe a borrow. Uh, but I think that it's definitely a buy for a lot of people. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people enjoy the more obtuse titles and the things where you have to poke around and think about a little bit where I like all my entertainment straight up on the surface. I don't want to think about it in any way, shape or form. <laughs> so while I'm slightly intrigued by what happened in this issue, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I actually, you know, I had ordered the first like three issues because with DCBS, you're so many, but I put my order in today for the next month and it was like issue four. Nah, I didn't order it. Cause I'm like, really, do I, do I really care that much? I'm going to save my 259 or whatever, right? Um, I think if someone had given me a trade of the first six issues or whatever, I probably would have read it all through in one mm. sitting because I was kind of fascinated by it. But to try to remember what in the hell went on a month at a time, like I already forget what happened. I'm, I'm <laughs> sitting here paging through the issue going, did I even read that? Holy crap, what is that about? I couldn't tell you the first thing that happened in this issue. <laughs> None of it stuck with me at all, other than the, the, the Suvlaki cover or whatever it is, right? All right. Uh, Murd, what was, what's your general opinion? Okay. Well, you know, I'm, I think I'm probably one of those who does enjoy the more the, the abstruseness of, of, of strange comics. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, 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 I like formless weirdness, and uh, certainly there's some of that going on in this first issue. You know, it's, I mean, it's Doom Patrol. You know, it's, it's, it, the titles become synonymous with superhero surrealism, so you kind of expect some of that. And, you know, Brian, I'm not, I'm not at all surprised, and, I'm, and this is not just because of your infamously bad memory for things that you've read, but I'm, just, I'm not surprised you couldn't remember this because most people couldn't remember it because there's really not much here. Uh, for the average mind or memory to latch on to. It's just, it goes in so many different strange little directions and yeah, that there's really not a whole lot of uh, coherent or substantive plot. Um, but yet it's, it's still, it's, it, it, it's fairly artful, deliberate weirdness and uh, I, I can sort of appreciate that. But yeah, the story such as it is is a little bit on the thin side. And I think you'd, uh, you'd, you'd probably be wise, Brian, to, to wait for the trade on this. I'm, I'm actually kind of wishing that I had done the same thing myself because I'm a little frustrated at how little we get in this first issue to grab onto. And I think a nice big chunk of all this strangeness would uh, – we, we get a bigger piece of whatever bizarre little mosaic uh, Gerard Way is putting together for us. Um, and it, it would uh, be a little more satisfying read like in a six-issue 
uh, serving. Oh, uh, I may as well mention while we're, while we're going along here, uh, the, uh, the writer was Gerard Way, a musician of uh, My Chemical Romance, also created uh, The Umbrella Academy for, for Dark Horse several years ago, which is another bizarre, surrealist superhero concept. So he's, right, he's a great choice to write the Doom Patrol. And he's also kind of the, uh, the impresario behind this whole young animal imprint that DC is now doing. Uh, the art is by Nick Darrington, color by Tamra Bonvalain, letters by the legendary Todd Klein. Um, and so yeah, the, the closest thing to a central plot we get here has to do with uh, a young uh, EMT, like an ambulance driver named Casey Brink, uh, who is apparently something of a weirdness magnet. You know, DC has had several of those over the years, and the Doom Patrol uh, figure, they're, they're some of the most prominent of those. And she apparently has been on a trajectory her entire life, or at least thinks she has been, that she's been drawn towards these bizarre happenings. She talks about how her mother, well, her internal monologue tells us that her mother uh, disappeared into a... Uh, into the sun, and she recalls, or thinks she recalls, her prom date being turned into a pool of protoplasm by a bunch of invading fantahawks, whatever that means. And in the course of this story, she experiences a couple of strange, seemingly unconnected events. Um, her uh, work partner, you know, sort of the dreamy, shamanic uh, Sam, I think his name is, or James, yes, yeah, Sam. Um, he uh, waxes philosophical about this hero he's eating. He throws it away, and then it explodes in a garbage can. And uh, there's some pages here that suggest that uh, Robot Man is... He, he's in some kind of microverse inside of the hero, and he caused that to happen. And then later on, uh, when uh, Casey is making her way home from work, Robot Man staggers out of an alleyway right in front of her and gets hit by a garbage truck, and she gathers up the pieces and takes them home. Um, and so that's what's going on with that. Um, and in the meanwhile, we get a couple of little uh, sort of interludes. Uh, as I said, the story goes off in a couple of strange random directions in the middle of what passes for a central plot. And we see uh, Niles Calder, the chief of the Doom Patrol, who's apparently alive and well. His head is back on his shoulders, and he's uh, experimenting with electronic keyboards. And a couple of little uh, teases that uh, the character that I is probably a favorite of Gerard Way's, I'd have to think, Danny the Street is going to be coming back in some way, shape, or form. We see a group of alien business executives having a meeting in a hotel on Earth uh, to uh, build a new fast food chain around Danny. Uh, there's a guy wearing an Oolong Island. You know, that's right. a significant yeah. name. To, sure. you know, it's been a part of Doom Patrol's recent history, and it was a figure big into the 52 Maxi series, sure uh, who's trying to put Danny together brick by brick, but uh, no, it doesn't seem that he has the right bricks. And at the very end, uh, we have... Uh, one of Danny's bricks with I'm sorry carved into it, lying uh, next to the dead body of a heroic-looking figure on an alien world someplace. So, yep, a lot of uh, unintelligible strangeness happening here. And uh, for as little as I'm understanding of it, I'm, I'm kind of enjoying the atmosphere of bizarrery. Uh, the one thing I didn't like, the one thing that uh, was kind of a shark jump moment for me is the scene near the end at Casey's apartment. When she comes home, her roommate is being a dick to her, and then suddenly the door opens and there's this uh, young tap-dancing lady in a sparkly tailcoat and a domino mask who causes the roommate to explode and then moves in with Casey. Yeah, that was a little weird. Yeah, it was – I mean, she's supposed to be a dedicated saver of lives here. You know, as scatterbrained as well as mentally imbalanced as she might possibly be, I, I just don't – I have a hard time thinking she'd be okay with this random stranger who just murdered her roommate just stepping in and uh, taking over his room and helping her feed nutrients to the robot skull that she found on the street earlier. Plus, I, on top of all that, I kind of uh, do feel that the roommate had a bit of a point in that uh, perky, quirky, adorkable personality. I think there are a few too many of perky, quirky, ingenue types in comics these days. So I kind of share his irritation, and I'm a little upset that he gets <laughs> blown up for expressing said irritation. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I guess maybe thinking that makes me not one of the dangerous humans that this line is supposed to be for. But, yeah. yeah. But anyway, it's uh, so some interesting ideas here, possibly, and uh, it's, it, it's just amorphously entertaining. And I, I'm going to stick with it for a few more issues, and uh, maybe we'll see more of... I mean, Gerard Way has a... St- assured us uh, here and there and everywhere. Uh, he's got a little editorial at the end of the issue and also in the pages of this neat little uh, young animal who's who in the DC Universe style pamphlet mm-hmm. that uh, was given out by DC a little while ago, which has little entries for some of the new young animal characters, including Casey Brink and also Cave Carson, who has a cybernetic eye. He assures us that uh, uh, he's uh, keeping an eye to the past 
and the history of these characters going forward, as well as trying bizarre new things with them. So we'll, in all likelihood, be seeing more semi-familiar faces from the Doom Patrol's past in future issues, and eventually, hopefully, a cohesive picture of what the hell's going on will emerge. But, yeah, so I, I, I think those of you listening, if you haven't tried this series yet, uh, take Brian's advice and uh, wait for the trade, maybe, and just get uh, one big chunk of the series uh, at a time. And hopefully, you'll be able to understand what's happening a little better if you do. I kind of um, felt the same way as um, as Brian did, and certainly things that you expressed, Adam, with it being, I, I I expected it to be a little bit irreverent and and aloof, and maybe beyond my desire to figure out what's going on in that first issue. But I think it was even a stretch more than that of of worse little vignettes put together that made no sense at all to me. I liked the character of Casey, and I liked seeing mm. Robot Man, and I liked seeing the Chief, and all that. That stuff made sense to me. Yeah. But for a first issue to try and bring somebody in, whether you're on the ground floor or returning to these characters, it was a little bit too out there at all. No, but you're, you're talking about the intro of uh, the, 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 the tap dancing girl, like Terry. Every, no. every, everything, everything about that issue, because I, I don't know a whole lot about the Doom Patrol history. Mm. I know of the characters, and I've read <laughs> some things, but yeah, this is not the best place to learn. Apparently. No. Um, and, and that's fine because, again, I know that the book has a history of being existential in this way. I didn't quite expect it to be this lost on me for a first issue in a new imprint. And that's fine. Like Brian said, there might be a thousand people, a bazillion people that love it, and that's great. I, like you, ordered uh, the first three issues and did the same thing with, nah, I'm not going to order issue four yet till I read the other two. I wish I would have just gotten the first trade and read it all together. I think it would have made a lot more sense to see where – that first issue ends up going for the first arc. And and that's somewhat of a problem, I think, in today's world. As we all know, everybody writes for the trade in some way. And and I'm just as guilty of it, of waiting for a trade in a lot of ways. Um, sometimes I want something like this that's new and, and kind of refreshed to be something that I want to read month to month. But I think this would read better in one six-month glop of either all the issues or a trade paperback. Um and and that's just the way the world is right now with writing comics. Um, I will say I really like the art in in mm. all its forms. I even the the little interlude with Robot Man in the microverse. I love that that sketchy kind of colored pencil look that everything had Ooh, for yeah. that to really distinguish that it was not in the regular world that that we were seeing before or after. Um, I like the little corporation cabal that was in there in the little hotel meeting so there were aspects of it that i did enjoy and and seeing the chief and seeing robot man just in their little small parts was enjoyable because again these are things that are familiar to me so that did help my enjoyment of the issue but i would suggest people wait for a trade unless you're really really into doom patrol or you really like looking between what's happening and trying to figure it out mm-hmm. And you can remember every single thing that happens to the next issue because, like, like you, Brian, I completely forgot everything until I paged through it. <laughs> Thank God Adam uh, summarized it the way he did because, yeah, okay, now I remember all that stuff. But for a first issue and a new imprint trying to bring some life back to a more mature kind of topic, I guess, uh, or run of books, it, it was a little bit too far for me to, to yeah. enjoy fully. A little too far out on the edge. But it, Again, art's great, and, and it did have some some do agree. interesting things in it that I would like to see happen. So I'll read the next two issues and then probably get a trade somewhere down the road. Chris, what are your thoughts? Well, for me, the reason why I, was, I sounded like I was struggling with my rating is that I've never read a Doom Patrol comic before in my life. Really? No, I, I know that's maybe a surprise. I mean, I, I'm familiar with their basic history. I mean, I, I just read them in 52 and all that. But I've, I never really liked the classic Grant Morrison run yet, although that's been collected in trade now, and I'm remiss in that. So I was looking forward to checking this out, and obviously I'm someone who does enjoy reading through the lines. I, I enjoy being challenged, but at the same time, maybe it's maybe it's also my, my older age and my the way I, I balance my time now, and also being a retailer. To me, this book was essentially utter nonsense. Um, the, the art the art is beautiful and one of the reasons why I gave it a little bar I think the art is stunning in this book and I really enjoyed uh, because there's different styles he, he, he incorporates here like when, when they show uh, Robot Man I guess on the world that's in the hero it's almost like he's like a, a wash to, to the drawing effect beautifully done so I really enjoy the art I loved for example on that sort of half splash page of 
Casey at the Will of the Ambulance. I found her character interesting. I found the character of her partner, Sam, very interesting. So I, I was initially engaged in this, and I knew the Doom Patrol has a reputation for you know, sort of being on the hinterland when it comes to storytelling, and I'm, I'm all for things like that. But it has to engage me. And as I go through this book, I, I start asking myself, okay, why am I still reading this? Because I felt like I was reading sort of that stereotypical, forgettable type of Vertigo book from the 90s that – there's like a gazillion of them in my 50-cent bins now that okay. are pretentious and mm. self-indulgent, and ultimately after a few years, nobody's ever going to read them ever again. Except um, Gerard no, I don't, Way, I'm not saying that's – I'm sorry, Murr. Go ahead. Except Gerard Way apparently because he, he – Well, and again – to echo your sentiments, I'll probably read the trade because I'm interested in these characters, and I'm interested to see where this is going, but – and I'll sound crotchety. My time is very, very limited, so when I'm reading comics, if it doesn't, if it doesn't engage me immediately, it's, 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 I'm not going to read it again when it comes to titles. And there's so many good comics out today. I mean, I th frankly, I think we're kind of in a, in a, in a golden age for, for just the quality of books that are being produced, especially independent titles. And to me, this, this felt like it was being obtuse for the sake of being obtuse. And I, I maybe I'm just a curmudgeon. That just doesn't interest me anymore. When, when I was 20, I was like, oh, wow, that's, you know, but just tell a good story. Uh, and maybe this will be a good story, but I'm probably either not going to read it or, like you guys said, I'll, I'll wait for the trade. So, Yeah, we'll wait for some other sucker to read 12 issues and tell us that it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's been done before. I have often exactly. been that sucker. All right, what's yeah, next, Chris, gentlemen? I, I remember ahead, I'm sorry, sir. all those, all those uh, like four to six issue Vertigo series oh, so in the 90s, you know. Yeah. We got them all because, like, some of them were really awesome. And, oh, yeah. Oh, you know? But then, and then, again, we were the right age and, like, the, you know, in college and rebelling. And so all the weirdness was, like, welcomed and yeah. it was so different. Oh, it's not men in tights. Oh, yeah. Yep, and yep. now it's like, what what trash? You know? <laughs> I mean, some of it, again, there were some that were very good, right? Absolutely. Um, but there were a lot that were just weird for no reason mm -hmm. other than to be weird, you know? Yeah, and, and and to be fair, that may be not that may, that may not be the case here. It feels that way initially, but you know, as as Murd mentioned, Gerard Way clearly knows the history of the Doom Patrol, mm -hmm. so I would I would probably certainly give the trade a chance. But this first issue overall turned me off. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, I'm going to bow out. I haven't had a chance to read some of these other ones yet, so uh, thanks for letting me join you for a few minutes. Oh, glad to have of course, you, brother. Good Thank you. you. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely, and enjoy the rest of the show. Good night, okay. my friend. We right, good night. Say hello to the family. I will. All right. What's next, Bert? All right. Well, which direction do we want to go in? Do we want to do Doctor Strange or are we going to do Mask? Those are the other two from September. Um, Let's do Mask. Let's do Mask right. for Shaney Poo. All right. All right. Well, uh, okay, so uh, this is Mask, Mobile Armored Strike Command Revolution number one. Um, okay, the creative team here is Brandon Easton, the writer, artist, Tony Vargas, colors, Jordi Esquin. Uh, okay, um, uh, Shane, you start us off this time. Um, while I, while I read it, I was a little bit... Well, well, I mean, you're, you're... I will. I was a little bit hesitant, but I will give it a buy. Good, Chris. I'll give it a borrow. Yeah, kind of a low borrow. I, I was on the fence... Again, while I was reading it for a borrow, but yeah, I, I, I pulled off a buy in the end for my love of the property, I think, more than anything. Mm -hmm. And Shane, would you do the listeners a favor? Why don't you just quickly remind people just the basis of the toy property? So back in, yeah. it was, I believe, 1985. See, on the spot, I forget. Um, I'm pretty sure it was 1985. Kenner came out with a toy line that kind of combined G.I. Joe and the Transformers in that you had people – who had to drive vehicles, but the vehicles would transform in some into something. Um, the the bad guys had a, a helicopter that turned into a jet. The heroes had like a like a, a Trans Am car, or a Thunderbird that turned into a jet. A motorcycle turned into a helicopter. Um, uh, like a Bronco Blazer thing turned into a battle wagon. Um, there are interesting aspects to that 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 just clung to me being at the right age having a love of 
Transformers and G.I. Joe. This was just a, a happy combination of the two. Uh, something that to, to combat, for Kenner to combat against what Hasbro was doing. Now, of course, it doesn't matter now because Hasbro owns what used to be Kenner. So mm. it's all under Hasbro anyway now. But back then, it was different. Kenner was still its own property. Star Wars was still going strong. And this was something new that, that came out, um, again, to, to kind of battle what Hasbro was doing with Transformers and G.I. Joe. Um, it was a, a cartoon that lasted over here, um, I think, t- quote, two seasons. The first season had like 70 episodes. The second season had like 20 or 30. Um, the second season got into a whole racing theme. Uh, the toys followed suit with a with a couple series of regular ones and then came out with a racing-themed one to model the cartoon. Then they went to a third series of stuff with uh, what they called Split Seconds, uh, where they had a hologram of a character that would quote, drive part of a vehicle as it would split off to kind of uh, fool whatever adversary you had to chase the wrong guy so you could get them in the end kind of stuff. Um, but I know over in uh, England, and I just learned this in the last couple of years, because what one thing I never did, as much as I watched the cartoon, had the toys, um, I never followed up in adulthood with um, – like a fan club about it or, or a love of it. I loved it. I had what I had and that was it. I never knew many other people that even knew what mask was, let alone having discussions on the internet or anything like what you would have today about it. Uh, but over there in England, they had a huge run of comic books and story books and annuals, yearbooks, all kinds of stuff. Uh, I, I wish I would have been over there or knew somebody at the time when all that stuff was being produced that I could have gotten a hold of more of that. I've had some some listeners be very kind to me and send me quite a few things, uh, maybe half a dozen or so, and, and I treasure them because it's it, it, it was a whole new avenue of mask stuff that I didn't even know existed. So uh, so that was that was thrilling for me. Um, the back in the day, DC also had a four issue miniseries, and then. A regular series, but the regular series only lasted nine issues. And that was it for the comics over here. But again, England had so much more in the way of, of comic book related material for Mask. That is interesting to know. Yeah, um, uh, it was fascinating. And, and I actually had all the comics once upon a time, got rid of them years ago. Um, before even knowing this comic came out, I had found the one copy of one issue I still had. And I got a bug up my butt. And found all the other ones in various places and now have all the DC stuff, the four issues, the nine issues. So I have all that again. Um, and I wanted to read it before this issue came out, but I never got to it, of course. But I, but I was thrilled to get them all back into the house and then have this announced. So I'm like, oh, okay. That was just uh, happy timing on my part uh, to get those other DC issues in time for this new image stuff. They're not related at all. Don't get me wrong. It's a completely different story. There's there's a whole new origin to this mask being produced by IDW. Um, it's going to be under the umbrella of the Hasbro properties that they all have. They're kind of all being interconnected. This revolution is a mini series that's going on, introducing some of these new properties and taking some of the ones that they had already started and that which are still Hasbro properties and bringing them under the fold. So you have things like ROM and Transformers, uh, Action Man, Mask. Uh, I think I'm forgetting one, one or two. But they're all kind of tied together in their own little universe. Yeah, Micronauts is in there too. Micronauts, too. thank you. Uh, that's all tied into this Hasbro universe that IDW is producing. Um, and a lot of these properties, while they're in the Revolution miniseries, also had a Revolution issue dedicated to them. And then the regular, in this case, the regular mask issues start after this uh, with another number one and, and so on and so forth. So, um, Outstanding uh, primer. Thank you, my friend. It's, it was quite exciting. Um, they took some liberties here and changed a little bit of directions um, with some ethnicities of characters. And that's fine. I, I, it really doesn't matter to me. I just want a good story. And I felt in this first issue, I got a good story. It was a good origin story. It gave you a background of Miles Mayhem, who in the cartoons and the old comics was the uh, the enemy, the bad guy. He was the leader of Venom, which is the vicious evil network of Mayhem. Um, Matt Tracker was the leader of Mask, which was the mobile armored strike command. And um, each of them also, uh, something that was unique that G.I. Joe and Transformers didn't have, each character has a mask or a helmet that they put on, and each helmet is powered by a, uh, um, energy from a meteor, in the cartoon's case, energy from a meteor that bestows individual different powers into each mask. Um, 
Uh, one of the masks was Bruce Sato's was a lifter mask, which he could shoot something and it would float in the air. Um, Matt Tracker's was a blaster, I think, that he could just uh, whack people with like a laser beam. Uh, some of that stuff I'm getting a little bit fuzzier on as as age creeps up on me. Mm. But but uh, oh, um, um, Brad Turner, who flew the the motorcycle helicopter, his was a hocus pocus mask, so he could create illusions. Uh, and make you think something, and meanwhile they're going around the back end to get to the bad guy. So again, again every character had its own mask that did different things. Uh, every vehicle did different things. Um, some went on land. Some split into two vehicles. Um, some just turned into more of like a battle wagon, like a cliff jumper did. Um, the the piranha one, which is a motorcycle for the bad guy, Sly Rax would drive it, and he'd hop into the sidecar. The sidecar would jut out into the water, and it was a little submarine. So. Th- Again, it combined all kinds of things from G.I. Joe and Transformers into this new property. So in this first Revolution issue, you get a really good, I felt, a really good primer origin to how the mask team is going to be formed. They're all kind of under Miles Mayhem right now, and he's creating a special forces team. And now I suspect at some point there will be differences that occur and they will split, and that's how they become adversaries. Um, the artwork's pretty good. You know, a lot of times um, I'm very skeptical about artwork on licensed properties. It's not always the best. But I was I was pretty pleased with how this artwork turned out. Um, the coloring, the dialogue, it, 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 it looks like what I expected it to look like. It's a little bit um, similar to what the cartoon looked like, but it has its own feel for these, for the new times and the new characters that are in here and uh, what they're going through to create this team. Um, yeah, I was, I was very pleased with it. I am looking very forward to the subsequent issues. I hope it gets enough traction that it sticks around for a while. Um, and I hope they turn it into more. I've heard rumors of movies and other things coming down the pike. So I I really hope it, it, it happens because I really did enjoy getting this origin story and seeing these characters begin and getting a new reintroduction to this whole universe. Uh, even aside of the whole Hasbro stuff, just the mask itself, the mask property was, was thrilling for me to see come to life again. Yeah. If they really are making a movie, Shane, then the, the, the comic survival is assured. Yeah. Oh gosh, I hope so. And Shane, you mentioned the connection to GI Joe appropriately. They, they introduced Scarlet at the end of the story. Oh yeah. Well, and, and something so, a couple years ago when they had an anniversary line of GI Joe toys that were carded on classic packaging from the eighties, they had a Matt tracker figure just kind of as a one-off, not a joke. I don't want to say joke, but just as a, as an homage to something that would, would be fun and would make sense to be inside of a GI Joe line. Cause you could have a special forces unit with a specialty group inside there. So they had one Matt tracker figure come out and I have a, I have actually have two copies of it. It was one of the last things I bought duplicates of because I, it was not the easiest thing to find uh, when I was looking for it. So when I saw two, I grabbed them. Um, one's open and one, one's packaged. It's, again, one of the last things I ever did like that. Um, but, yeah, it was exciting to see something like that come out in the G.I. Joe line, having it be with Kenner rightfully so for all that time. And and now to to see the other way where they're in, introducing Scarlet, Scarlet at the end of this and it's part of this whole Hasbro universe now. It, it was a lot of fun for me to read. Uh, Mago. Oh, sure. Thank you, my friend. Uh, for me, I, I didn't know what to expect here because I'm beyond Shane's uh, – Always helpful proselytizing over the years. I, I know nothing about Mask. I didn't play with them uh, when they came out. I, I, me- I remember them being out, but that was about it. So I kind of went in this as a blank slate, just beyond Shane's always helpful uh, background information. And while this didn't, you know, bull me over, I thought it was a very solid opening story. What I liked about it was there's an edge to it in the sense that there's there's a darkness there. It's not just a dopey, like typical licensed toy property comic. In that there's there's a sense of menace in the way Mayhem is forming this team. I mean, two people die before the issue's even over, yeah. and you're not sure if that was actually orchestrated by Mayhem on purpose or it was it some kind of malfunction. Um, I like how Tracker is portrayed not out of the gate as some you know all American super confident you know super soldier. He's got doubts. He has anxieties. He's unsure of his role as a potential leader. Um, well, and so that, that, if, if yeah, I may ahead, interrupt, sorry. his character above anybody else, his was the the greatest departure we've seen so far in in just this issue and the little spot that they had in the Revolution mini. Um, 
his character is the biggest departure because when we're introduced to him in the cartoon in the comic book, he is wealthy. He is the 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 backbone of the whole mask organization. Um, he's got a son. It's all figured out. You've already he's already in his thirties and is established. And and this is a completely different character, just with the same name. Yeah, um, much younger character. Too. Much younger character, like Chris said, much very unsure of himself. So it, yeah, it's interesting to see him on this ground level introduction. Murd, how about you? Uh, well, I guess I'm I'm somewhere between the two of you in terms of my familiarity with the property, and and thank you, Shane, for that a very entertaining tr- side trip into the world of toys. <laughs> I think we all had a lot to learn about uh, the Mobile Armored Strike Command. And, 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 we, and as, as much as I know, there are people that know so much more. It's it's daunting. Well, I'll be daunted right along with you then. Because you, know, <laughs> you were right, by the way. It was 1985 when Mask was introduced. I was six. And uh, I can just barely remember watching the cartoon. I think I only saw a few episodes. But I definitely had a couple of the toys. And was, yay, vehicles that turn into other stuff. Yay. So, yeah, I, I see what you mean about G.I. Joe meets Transformers there. And, and I was 13. I can still remember the Kmart that I bought it at. Because I lived in Pottstown and Boyertown area. That's where I grew up. But we had friends. My parents had friends up here in the Reading area. And the Kmart that was on uh, 422 in Exeter across the street from the Boscovs. That's where I bought my first mask toy. It was Condor. <laughs> um, we took it to the – we stopped at the friend's house, and I'm sitting there playing with it. I just – I can – that's just something I distinctly remember doing. You were old enough to buy your own toys. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, again, I was 13, so I'm kind of on the cusp of not playing with toys, I guess. But, boy, did I get full on into this. <laughs> I'm not sure you ever really got past no, that. No, I really age. didn't. But <laughs> and I'm glad you didn't. No, me either. <laughs> but yeah, I, so I had Switchblade and Rhino. I think those are the nice. two that I had. Was Rhino the the, the, the semi with the missile launcher in the yeah, back? Yep. yep, I definitely had that. That's one I, of the few <laughs> ones I still have left. <laughs> terrorized my parents' furnishings with that little missile launcher. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Move all the breakable knickknacks away from yeah. the, the six year old. Because that thing shot out pretty good. Mm, yeah, you know, good good ballistics on there. Um, so, but yeah, really, it was just uh, you know the vehicles and the little plastic helmets that conferred cybernetic superpowers. That's that's all Mask really was to me. And this is uh, taking the concept a little more seriously than I'm yeah. accustomed to. Um, so yeah, Brandon Easton um, hasn't done too too much in comics, but he's done some, and he's, he was also on the writing staff of Agent uh, Agent Carter on ABC. Oh, nice. um, I know that. His, his name is getting around now. He's getting some more high profile stuff to write, and uh, so he's. Uh, Trying to, uh, you know, it's, it's a characterization is always like the big challenge for uh, the writers of licensed property comics. You know, trying to breathe some real three dimensional personalities into little plastic people. And, um, and of course, uh, the, the, the cartoon and the uh, previous comics uh, laid some of the groundwork for him. But as you've already said, Jane, he's gone in a very different direction from uh, all of those takes on the property. Um, so, yeah, the story, it's. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, 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 th- th- there's the, the requisite amount of action. There's some good solid doses of action so it doesn't get too boring. And uh, there's uh, definite evidence of characterization going on here. And I think uh, you, you mentioned how different Matt Tracker is. I'd, I'd also point out uh, Miles Mayhem because uh, he is not uh, – he's not just the uh, – you know, the, the, the world beater he was in the cartoon show. He's uh, he's portrayed as kind of more like a Thunderbolt Ross type, uh, hard bitten yeah. military man, plus like master manipulator. You know, many years experience in military intelligence and compartmentalization. Uh, someone who actually wants to save the world rather than just conquer it or you know do whatever Mayhem's real motives were yeah. back in the in the old cartoon, which was money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go, just greed. That's, that's an old standby. It's yeah. a go to. Uh, but yeah, he apparently wants to save or protect the world, but his uh, Values have gotten so badly warped and curdled after so many years in the game that uh, he's uh, decided he needs to form this uh, secret task force for this Project Spectrum thing he's doing in order to uh, rule it by doing some very objectionable things. Well, save it by doing some very objectionable things. And hence he gathers together these people and uh, tests these new helmets and vehicles out on them. And a couple of them, as Chris mentioned, do die in the yeah. attempt, which is a little on the edgy side. Um, uh, but yeah. On the whole, though, despite the action, the characterization, and the whole thing, at the end of the day, just kind of feels like kind of a dry read to me. I wasn't all that entertained or drawn in by it. Um, I'm not at all sure that what he was doing with Mayhem is that much of an improvement. He's trying to make him more layered, complicated, enigmatic, and I just found that I cared less about him than I did about the straight-up bad guy from, you know, I was actually a little bit afraid of Miles Mayhem, I can remember, from the little Mm -hmm. bit of the cartoon show I saw. Um, But uh, not so here. 
And Easton makes way too much of this central conceit he latches on to. Uh, on the first page here, there are five personality traits that the f- perfect special forces candidate will possess. And this is uh, Mayhem's internal monologue, and he just keeps coming back to these five traits throughout the whole story. This is clearly something that Easton stumbled upon during some of his background reading and thought, oh, hey, I could uh, build a whole episode or issue of something around that. And he yeah. did here, and uh, f- uh, for my money, the results are probably not as uh, engaging as he had hoped they would turn out to be. Uh, and then there's the fact that... That this is uh, this is a revolution tie-in. It's a part of this big uh, uh, mashup uh, Hasbro intellectual property uh, crossover thing that IDW was doing. I don't think this was the ideal way to introduce Mask to the readership. Yeah, it's, it, it, it serves as kind of like a zero issue or a negative one issue for the Mask ongoing series. It hasn't had a chance to establish its like, identity as a series before it's exp- it's thrown into the pool with all these other properties that IDW has already been publishing for a couple of years or at least several months. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of at a disadvantage there. And th- there's also the fact that it doesn't really tie in that much with the revolution thing to begin with. No. No, I'm not sure. Even for myself, I'm not sure whether that's a good thing or a bad. I I think it's a good thing in this case, but I would have rather since it's since this issue itself does not tie into revolution all that much. I would have rather this been a zero issue, and still had them in that revolution miniseries just a little bit at least. So far, I haven't read past the first issue or two, and and that's fine. Just them being in there, if they want to be included in the in the crossover, great. But again, I would have rather had this been a zero issue. Um, it's not the strongest way to bring people in because, one, it doesn't tie into the miniseries all that much in this issue. Um, and to banner it that way, uh, it, I think that was just a little bit miss of the mark. Yeah. Yeah, it was just not, not the right time for that. So. You know, Easton kind of pays lip service to it. He mentions that Mask or well, uh, Project Spectrum, you know, yeah. what will eventually branch off, as you said, Shane, into Mask and Venom later on. And, and Spectrum's what Matt Tracker's Mask was called in the cartoon. So right. I, I can't remember if they mentioned if that's what it is in this issue. If I it's just that's the project. At the very end, I think they do introduce Matt Tracker as – yeah, Matt Tracker codename Spectrum, Spectrum. Right here when uh, Mayhem is introducing him to Scarlet on yeah, the last yeah. page. So Scarlet's there. We're told that Project Spectrum was put together to deal with the cyber troll problem, so it is trapped right between G.I. Yeah. Joe and Transformers, yeah. as you said, Shane. And also, uh, Mayhem confers with Dr. Mindbender on that one page. So that's, yeah, that which is kind of interesting, neat. yeah. So, yeah, I, I do feel like Easton was kind of welching on the contractual obligation to tie in, but... Uh, as we've said, this is it's a difficult position he was put in. It was, wasn't the best idea to make Mask tie in from with Revolution right out of the starting gate anyway. Yeah, so yeah. you can't blame him too much. No, and I, and I kind of feel like that would have been his zero issue and he might have been told, like what you said, hey, tie this in somehow. Let's put the origin in there. Okay. And that's what had to happen. Yeah. And it's not the best origin story I've ever read. No. Yeah, so, but I have pre-ordered the first issue of the actual Mask ongoing series, which is going to jump us, I assume, back to the present. This whole thing is taking place so. in the past. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we can see the divide between Mask and Venom, and things get back on track. And uh, you know, as I said at the at the outset, my recollection of Mask, you know, the key to my nostalgia for the property is the cool transforming vehicles and the superpower helmets. And since we had so much of this uh, groundwork being laid and the characterization and mayhem scheming and we didn't get very much of that. Yeah. So that that I think is one of the reasons why this left me cold. So unless you're a hardcore Mask person, like a big Mask fan, one of those people that would even intimidate Shane with your knowledge, I would recommend just not bothering to buy this issue and picking up with Mask number 1. So yeah, I give it a low borrow for me. All right. God, I love that. Work your decks, brothers. Well, that leads us to Doctor Strange Annual Number One. All right. Would you like to lead us off, uh, Chris? Yes, uh, I will give this a very strong buy row. Hmm. It's just uh, your average borrow for me. I would give it a buy because I'm getting the Doctor Strange as a series anyway, even though I'm way far behind it. But I will give this issue a borrow. I actually got a little frustrated reading it halfway through because I was completely confused because I had not read anything in the last six months or a year. So I, I was I was really lost. That's my fault. I don't think that would happen to anybody who's read the series regularly. All right. So – and Shane, I'm going to piggyback in your comments in just a moment because I think they're very apt for this discussion. Uh, this is written by Catherine Immonen, art by uh, Leonardo Romero, which I thought was fantastic. Uh, color by the great Jordi Belair. 
Letters VCs Corey uh, Pettit, cover by W. Scott Forbes. I, I'm delighted to say I got a variant cover by the great Ron Lim. Ooh, oh, and nice. uh, yeah, uh, and I haven't seen Ron Lim and Chris Sotomayor actually working together. And I haven't seen Ron Lim's art in a while. It was a treat to see that. It's 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 a. I don't know if you can see in, in my, my image here. It's um. Oh yeah. Doctor Strange fighting uh, some of the mindless ones from the dark dimension. Nice. Ron Lim, Sotomayor art. So that was a treat. All right. The reason why I get this a, a by row is is to, to piggyback on, on Shane's comments. I thought this is, this was a, an excellent annual. When I when I when I think of a comic book annual. I don't. I'm not looking for the big crossover events that 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 animals usually sacrificed on the altar of that type of event. I'm looking for something that that fleshes out or adds an interesting dimension to a particular character in that character's world. And I thought that annual achieved this very well. But again, to support what Shane was saying, if you haven't been reading the Doctor Strange title by Jason Aaron, which is one of the best titles Marvel's producing these days, you're going to be kind of lost to what they're referring to here. Throughout the story, so that's why I gave it a buy row. For me personally, as a fan of the character and of the, the current series, this is a buy. But if you're if you're someone who is considering picking this up because you know it is four ninety nine, um, that's why I said buy row because you're not going to fully know what's going on in the story. That aside, I was very excited for this book, and the reason why I pushed for it to be an OTR is because we're finally getting Clea back as a character in Doctor Strange's role. She hasn't appeared at all. In the current series, and Murd, when was the last time we even saw Clea? Do you remember? I can't. Prior to this, I have no idea, yeah. Chris. Yeah, it's it's been a while. I think it's safe to say that. And she's always, I, I'll be, I'll, you know, frankly, when I think of all the, the great, you know, female Marvel characters, she's always been one of my favorites, especially the way Gene Colan would render her. And I think uh, Romero did a wonderful job, sort of capturing the essence of Clea visually and her her outfit. Uh, and her beauty, and I thought that was extremely well done. And what I loved about this story was that Inman does, a, I think, a, a really wonderful job returning to what happened between Strange and Clea, because they, they were lovers for many years, and he, he saved her and helped her fight uh, Dormammu in the Dark Dimension. Uh, Murray, is she the daughter of Umer? Yes. Yeah, well, another one of Strange's uh, great nemeses from the Dark Dimension. So there's a lot of history between these two characters, and you know, eventually they parted ways. We talked about that in the Doctor Strange Spotlight Murder and I did last year. Um, but I was interested to see where she was and, and were they going to bring her into the wonderful new series by Aaron. And I think Emma did a wonderful job here sort of touching upon that history without, without overburdening the story with you know a, a constant series of, of flashbacks and recaps. But you get a sense of, of, of the depth of the relationship, you know what it meant to them, and – you know, sort of how it it went went, went to, uh, on divergent paths, and I really appreciated how it's not like a happy ending where they're back together at the end and you know everything's hunky dory and they're you know swooning in each other's arms. You know, there's a lot of history between them, and you know she she's re- returning to uh, his sanctum in a sense to in a mystical way to quote break up essentially because that they had this mystical bond and. Uh, in the end, they, they you know they decide to, in a sense, maintain their bond, but as friends. And I, I just thought it, w- it was a very adult story in the sense that she's approaching a relationship that clearly had vicissitudes, and she doesn't cheapen that history by just saying, "Oh, we're just everything's great and we're we're back together." It's more complicated than that, and it was suffused with some great humor. Uh, you know, Wong is, is is used very effectively in the story, and also just they're tying it into uh, what's going on in the main book. They bring in the character of Zelma, who's a very interesting uh, new supporting c- character in Doctor Strange's cast. And uh, I thought Romero's art almost had a bit of a Mike Allred feel to it. I, I really enjoyed uh, his rendering of the characters. Uh, very solid annual. For me, a buy, but speaking to uh, listeners out there and, and potential readers of the series, it, it's a buy row if you're not familiar with the Doctor Strange series. That's my take, gentlemen. All right. Coming up on your heels here, Chris. All right. Well, this yeah, this story, I wasn't quite as uh, into it as, as you were, Chris. Um, and, and part of that is what uh, Shane alluded to, that uh, you know, if, you're, uh, if, if you're not uh, caught up with your reading of the Doctor Strange series, you're not going to know who the Empirical is. You're not going to know what right. Doctor Strange's and, and his Sanctum's current statuses are. Um, 
Uh, so yeah, that. But I, I found that fairly simple to get around. Honestly, it's and it's. I, I enjoyed this story for the uh, two quality kernels of insight it provides into the relationship between Strange and Clea, as, as Chris uh, outlined in depth. Um, you know, well, they, they, they are two mature adults who've kind of drifted apart, as, as uh, ex lovers tend to do. But uh, and then you know, things don't have uh, an ideal resolution in that they, uh, you know, they're not back in each other's arms. They part as friends. They remain technically mystically married. But uh, then, you know, the bomb is dropped by Zelma at the end that, uh, oh, hey, Strange is just using her again. He just he, – reminding us that uh, Stephen Strange has not always been the most pleasant or um, emotionally sensitive of human beings in the Marvel Universe. He's a dedicated protector, but he's not afraid to use – well, I mean, that, that, that's really most of what he's done as a Sorcerer Supreme. He calls on other entities and objects of power and sometimes people close to him uh, to, to just tap them uh, for mystic power to do what he needs to do to protect the Earth. And he's – basically stringing Clea along at this point uh, so he can continue to do that. That is what Zelma calls – and is this Zelma character, Chris? Has she been around in the Jason Aaron series? Is that where she was introduced? Yes, yes. Yep, this is the first time I'm seeing her, and I already do not like her. She comes in. She's uh, first annoyingly – you know, she's on cloud nine, just a uh, – steeped in bliss from her Jamaican vacation. And I feel somewhat vindicated by the fact that Clea tells her, all right, shut up, and then steals and weaponizes this bliss, and she immediately becomes highly irascible for the rest of the issue and so irritating in a different way. Yeah, so I am uh, not a fan of Zelma. Let me just put that out there. Um, but, yeah, the, the story as a whole, it's, it was entertaining enough, and uh, it was, uh, I, I definitely second uh, the uh, plaudits for the artwork. Um, uh, Leonardo Romero is kind of – reminds me a little of Marcos Martin as indeed the entire issue between uh, his work and Catherine Imminence. It seems that the two of them together are trying to tap the same vein that Brian K. Vaughan and Martin did uh, in the Doctor Strange The Oath series that we're always gushing about. Um, but yeah, I don't think they followed the recipe that they followed quite as well or skillfully, and the story is not quite as good. Uh, to, the thing that bothered me the most about it is that it's it tries to be poignant and poetic at some p points, like the, the first page where Clea is drafting her magic spell, you know, this powerful bit of magic, this plot device that can break any magical contract that she wants to use to dissolve her and Stephen's marriage, but instead she ends up uh, wasting it to get Strange out of hot water with his demonic contractor. Uh, that that first page where she's drafting the spell, it, it gave me a twinge of nostalgia for like comics of the early '90s. You know, some of those like pretentious Vertigo or Vertigo wannabe comics that you were talking about earlier, Chris, in reference to uh, the Doom Patrol and uh, Gerard Way's approach to it. Um, so that that was kind of neat. And uh, the panel on the I think it's the fifth page where Clea shows up in her street clothes, hand in pocket. That's that is a great image of Clea, and it's probably it sure going is. to stick with me in my memory. It's, you know, if, if nothing else does from this issue, that panel will. But yeah, you know, what what bugs me about this story is that it's kind of totally inconsistent. Like sometimes it's trying to be all poignant, and other times it's being hokey jokey, and yeah, it, it just didn't for for my money mesh quite seamlessly enough. Uh, it needed to be evened out a bit. But yeah, for for all that, it's an enjoyable enough story. But you know, and, and an additional stroke against this that I'm going to bring up now. Um, I'm probably going to bring up the same one, judging by what you're looking at. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, let's see. The lead story is only 20 pages long, so it's really no longer than no more original content here than in a normal like 32 page comic with you know the standard uh, story length. There is about 20 pages uh, plus ads, uh, and the rest of this 4.99 annual issue is then padded out with preview pages, which I'm pretty sure are not a they're just lifted, like the first several pages from the first issue of the upcoming Doctor Strange and the Sorcerer's Supreme, uh, featuring Young Ancient One, which is an interesting enough idea, and I, I am kind of interested in that series, especially now that I know that it's got Young Ancient One in it, which is something Marvel actually did try to do at least once before, mm -hmm. uh, back in the early 2000s, the Epic Anthology, they tried to, which lasted like two issues max. Uh, they did have a series called, literally, Young Ancient One. Uh, telling us stories of uh, this young man. And now we get to see him uh, teaming up with Merlin for some kind of magical mission, which seems interesting enough, but uh, again, it's just the first few pages reproed from an upcoming comic, and we're expected to pay an extra dollar to read these in advance. Uh, so boo on Marvel for that. So, yeah. Put it all together, it adds up to a borrow, and uh, I was thinking of making it a bar but then I felt generous and decided to just make it a borrow. <laughs> 
Well, and, and, and part of why I stopped partway through was I, I, one, didn't know much of anything about CLIA at all. So I have to do a little bit of research on here. What you both have said has helped a little bit because, again, I had no knowledge of her before this. My my reading of Doctor Strange has been extremely limited. Um, and, and, again, that's my own fault. It's not something I was interested in. Um, and not because of the movie. I was interested in this book before the movie coming out. I, I the, the issues that I've read of the regular series I love – um, so I do want to get caught up on it, but I also didn't want to read through this and remember something that I still want to learn by normal reading process of those other issues. Uh, but when I saw the preview pages, I really got turned off thinking, oh, okay. So part of this annual, which I always thought annuals were exceptionally special, whether they be part of a crossover or not, whether I like that or not, I do think that an annual should be special. Um, I think what Chris had said about the artwork being beautiful and being a good tie into the regular series and a good way to reintroduce Clea is is probably spot on and great. I was completely irritated that there were preview pages for an mm. upcoming book thrown into an annual, so I didn't get an annual's worth of comics out of the annual. That is the thing. Um, and again, paying what you said four ninety nine for a book at, at regular price that's frustrating. And like you say, boo on Marvel for doing that. Um, but I did think the artwork was great, and I can't wait to um, get caught up on Doctor Strange and then reread this in a normal fashion and, right. and, Put and it really get the, the, feel con- the, the full context of what's happening with Doctor Strange at this point. Um, so, yeah, kind of bleh. On that pick, but. Well, it was shame to, to second that because I, you know, I didn't even think about the preview pages because I kind of just blew by them. But you guys, I couldn't agree with you guys more. Oh, so irritating. And this, this is another reason why I'm always trumpeting the independently owned comics that are like Saga, the Lazarus, the Southern Bastards, and so forth, because because those creators control their books, they clearly are taking pains to give you as much value for your money as they can wring out of out of the, their, their comics because you're getting essays, you're getting letters pages, you're getting commentary. And I really respect that and appreciate that both as a retailer and as a reader. And you know, you don't see that as much of course with, with the, the larger corporate companies. And uh, you know, I, I can understand you feel like you've been taken for a bit of a ride um, when something like that happens. So, you know, once again, buy indie. <laughs> <laughs> Where to next, gentlemen? Well, onward into the October country then. So All now right. we've got our three picks from October. We've got Batman Beyond, we've got Jessica Jones, we've got Moonshine. I would like to recommend that we start with Batman Beyond. That's because... fine. That's the only one I have of these. I thought I had Jessica Jones. I didn't, apparently. So I will have to get that at some point. Mm. Maybe I'll borrow yours now. And, sure, it's here. And maybe take a picture of the digital copy and read it and then talk about it later mm. because I was uh, I was going through my books trying to find it and I really thought I ordered that bugger because I... Really interested in the book. Well, you are perfectly welcome to the digital code because I will never, ever use it. Uh, but, yeah, plus you're kind of on a, a time clock here. So. A little bit. We're, uh, we're still good. Yeah, sure enough. Yeah, we've got like a 45 minutes before yeah. you need to take off. But yeah, let, let's start with Batman Beyond anyway. That's fine. And, yeah, this one, we're in kind of an interesting situation here, folks, because <laughs> <laughs> we had we, uh, – <laughs> A few crossed wires here. That's partly the, the the fault of the three of us, and partly DC's fault for the strange <laughs> structure of their rebirth initiative. Um, so we got Batman Beyond here. Um, I read only the first issue of the new Batman Beyond ongoing series. Chris read only the uh, Batman Beyond Rebirth special that preceded that first issue, and Shane read both of them. Yes, I did. <laughs> so you're going to get three different perspectives here <laughs> on this Batman Beyond thing. Okay, and uh, it's uh, – well, at least the one I – I don't know. Maybe the creative team is different on the Rebirth uh, uh, special, but uh, the, the first issue of The Ongoing is by uh, written by Dan Jurgens, uh, art by Bernard Chang, colors by uh, uh, Marcello Maiolo. Um, the – Rebirth issue is Dan Jorgens writing, Ryan Sook artist and cover, um, Jerry Lawson pages one through fifteen and twenty, and Tony Avina A V I N A uh, sixteen through nineteen um, are the colorists, and then Travis Lanham did the letters. Mm. So yeah, a little bit. Wow, you got Ryan Sook artwork in there. Yeah, huh? yeah oh. you can take a look at it if you want. I feel cheated. Thank you, Shane. <laughs> All right. So, well, based on the uh, one issue that I read, I, I, I gave – I actually was going to give this one a bar ants too, but now realizing the, something I hadn't realized that I, I'm just going to up that to a normal borrow. 
Um, I would give these a borrow for anybody, a buy for me because I like Batman Beyond a little bit more. But um, I think you have to – well, I'll cover that later. It's a borrow for both issues for me. A borrow for me as well. All right. We're both uniformly neutral on this. Uh, all three of us are uniformly neutral on this. Um, so, yeah, I, I read only the number one issue. So I do kind of feel like uh, – so, so be warned, folks. You know, the, the way DC set up this uh, relaunch, yeah, each of these new series kind of has two number one issues. Sometimes you can just skip the rebirth uh, one shot. Sometimes you can't. This is one of those times when you clearly can't because I was going to ream Dan Jurgens and or DC for what a poor example of a first issue this uh, – Batman Beyond number one happens to be. It, it, it's definitely starting in Medias Race. Uh, Batman Beyond's uh, friend Dana Tan has been captured by the Joker Street Gang. Oh, here. Yeah, I just yeah, took I a quick glimpse something. at the Rebirth no, no, One Shot special, and it's uh, the, the artwork in there is very nice. Ryan Sook is a talent. Uh, not that Absolutely. Bernard Chang isn't too, but I, I prefer Sook. Um, uh, so yeah, the Joker is dead in this. Uh, I mean, this is all taking place in the future, of course, uh, and uh, the Jokers are planning to revive him. Somebody is ranting about how the Joker is going to be the first person ever brought back to life. I don't know what version of DCU history he's living in, but uh, <laughs> there have been a lot of people come back to life well, in the these DC Jokers universe. are just kind of thuggy people, so they're not the most intelligent. Yeah, they're not uh, educated, huh? Yep, and uh, Batman Beyond is in the middle of a big fight with a big, like, uh, juiced up. Ju- he's probably on Venom. Probably. Uh, yeah, so some big Joker bruiser. Um, and he's uh, swamped by Joker gang members. Meanwhile, his kid brother is bringing some other member of the, of the supporting cast into the Batcave Beyond for the first time. And at the end of the issue, uh, Terry McGinnis, Batman Beyond, is about to go undercover. Um, yeah, and, uh, and there's nothing wrong with this, really, as an ongoing issue of, of like just a everyday issue of an ongoing series. It doesn't feel at all like a first issue, but as I've already said, technically it isn't. It's uh, it's more like the second issue, but it has number one on the cover yeah. you know, after the Batman Beyond Rebirth number one issue that uh, uh, we pr- I probably should also have read in addition to reading this. Um, one of the reasons I give this a borrow is, you know, just to come clean here, uh, straight out, real talk. I've never really been that fond of Batman Beyond. I mean, I I remember when it came on the Kids WB uh, in like 1998, I think. Yeah, it was. Uh, I remember thinking my favorite thing about it was the opening sequence. Uh, something about I don't know whether it was the the uh, the uh, Blade Runner light Technotopia Gotham setting or the uh, or maybe it was Terry McGinnis. He's not a bad kid, really, but something about the idea of somebody just stumbling into the role of Batman instead of earning it as uh, much as uh, Bruce Wayne and uh, you know just putatively Dick Grayson and uh, the, his uh, Robin apprentices did and it just uh, McGinnis just stumbling into it the way he did I, I never really enjoyed you know his uh, costume his tools they were never as cool as the originals to me I just never really got into it this may this is at most the second Batman Beyond comic I think I've ever bought uh, and Jurgens has been at the driver's seat of, of this franchise for some time now, I know. And so he's just kind of continuing on with what he was doing before this whole rebirth bump in the road of, of distracted him. And I was about to get on his case for uh, not uh, bringing readers up to speed better than he did in this issue. But again, that happened in the Batman yeah. Beyond Rebirth number one issue that I didn't actually read. Uh, so, yeah, the story here is – yeah, it's – it was a little confusing for me, not knowing what was really going on and uh, not uh, liking the characters that much to start with. Uh, I did learn from this issue that uh, – this might be a spoiler – that uh, Bruce Wayne Beyond is apparently dead at this point. Um, I, uh, I'm going to give extend some props to Bernard Chang for uh, one particular story page. Uh, let me see. Two, four, six, seven. It is page eight. Uh, it's in the middle of uh, Batman's fight with the big uh, – steroidal joker goon it's like a 12 page <laughs> layout with a you know rectangular grid with a little vecta- rectangular uh, border it, it, it's almost like a it's like a, like a stained glass picture window or a, like a mondrian painting it's I, I like the layout of that page that is cool that is uh, y- original uh but it's the most memorable thing about this comic beyond that so i'm just going to stop talking at this point and say eh borrow now, Shane, who have read both of these comics and are more knowledgeable about the character anyway, you enlighten us. Okay, so the I have to get caught up on the previous Batman Beyond series because where that started compared to where it probably ended and then this Rebirth issue started, I'm a little confused in that interim. I read the first few issues of that last series and I liked what they were doing with it 
especially concerning one specific character, which I'm not going to mention because that would be a spoiler if I'm remembering right and I don't want to get my facts completely wrong. Um, that being said, reading this one, the Rebirth issue gives you a pretty good um, status quo of where Terry McGinnis has been and what's been happening in his universe and his world um, to, for him to come back to his little brother to ease back into Gotham and sort of start becoming Batman again uh, in the Rebirth issue. He runs into a situation where he thinks he's ready. He puts on the suit and he goes out and he gets his ass handed to him. Because he realizes just how out of touch he is with being Batman, how much he has lost with where he was being away the way he was. Um, so it, it, it's, it's kind of a slap in the face for him to have to retrain harder to get back in shape again. Um, you get reintroduced to his brother who was in the cartoon. Mm-hmm. You get reintroduced him. to his other supporting characters. Uh, to Dana, and the end of this issue, he battles the Jokers, which are always a mainstay of of the Batman Beyond universe. Um, The end of this issue has Dana getting kidnapped, reveals the whole them trying to bring the actual Joker back to life, and then the next issue starts, and you get the whole first part of that battle trying to get Dana back, and him battling the Jokers, and them bringing the Joker back to life even more. So, yeah, I really think more than most rebirth issues and first issues. And I've read a good chunk of them from DC. I think this one's really tied close together where you need that first one in order to read the next one. Oh yes. Um, and I know that that is with the case with some of the other ones out there, but this one was really blatant about it. Um, so yeah, if you missed the rebirth issue, boom, you were kind of lost mm-hmm. the, yep. just like what you said. My experience stands as pretty, um, yeah. The I like the art in both of them, but but I do agree the the Ryan Sook arc is just a little bit nicer, um, just more enjoyable. Mm. Um, I like I have always liked this universe. I'm happy that DC brought Terry McGinnis and Batman Beyond into the fold. I've read a number of the comics that have gone through. I've watched all the cartoons and the m- movie that was afterwards about. Um, the Joker's return and such that it was the way they did it. I kind of can't remember what that movie was actually called. Maybe it was just Joker Return. I, I, boy, I have to look that up then. But um, so I was excited that they keep being able to bring this character in this universe, part of the DC universe, back. I enjoy it thoroughly. I I can see why some people don't like it. I completely understand why it's something a little bit foreign that you would enjoy. Um, I like his gadgets. For the suit and the and the differences, because the first cartoon has Batman in this suit as 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 d c universe at that time progressed, Batman changed with it in that he needed something more than just his gray suit to battle all this blade Runner techno babble stuff that was going on um that being said, Terry McGinnis just didn't walk into it. It might look like that at first. But there are reasons that he ended up as Batman, and they kind of come to fruition if you watch, I think it's the very last Justice League Unlimited episode is sent to this. That is an absolutely fantastic episode. I despise that episode. Oh, See, I, this is something – Ian Levenstein and his friend Chris Nautis have been seething over that. Okay. And I'm kind of seething along with them because the revelation about Terry's uh, true parentage made no goddamn sense. It's one of the worst examples of retcon I've ever seen. I don't like that it happened in the Justice League cartoon. Yeah, they wasted an episode of that show to tell us this Especially being the last episode. So that I completely think is off kilter wrong. I think they should have done it in another venue. But it is what it is. I do enjoy that episode. I really hated it. But to and that's each, fine. To each his own. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, like you, Shane, I've, I love Batman Beyond the concept. I didn't. I haven't seen every episode of the show as you have, but I've watched many of them. Um, so I was looking forward to this. I did not read the previous series, and that's one of the reasons why I gave this a borrow. In that, if you haven't read the previous series, you, you're kind of adrift. Uh, you, you, you infer that Bruce Wayne is dead, um, but like they mentioned, his mother died in a war. I had no idea what they were talking about, um, meaning Terry's mother. Uh, you know, and one thing I wanted to ask you, Shane, when they flash back to his origin, that's right from the cartoon, correct? Yeah, I think so. Yes, because I, I haven't seen it. the original episodes in a long, long time. But um, 
that's my impression. I've always loved Ryan Sook's art. I, I thought it was gorgeous uh, throughout the story. Um, I just, I like the Batman Beyond concept. I always have since I, since I watched the show. Admittedly, I've never really read any of the comic book versions of the Batman Beyond, so I was, I was a little bit lost here. Although you can you can infer as I was reading it, um, I've always liked Terry's voice as a character as as he narrates his experiences here. The Steroid Joker character on steroids was a little too nineties for me, and and uh, like the last page, I actually laughed out loud and not in a good way because yeah. I I just thought okay, <laughs> like so apparently we're going to resurrect the Joker for the umpteenth time or whatever they're going to do here with that, and uh, that I, I that just another reason why I gave this a borrow. I, I just found that a little tired that whole kind of approach. Granted, we'll see what they do with it in subsequent issues. Um, but it was great to see Terry again in the bat suit. I enjoyed them reviewing the origins. I, th- I think he has a strong, like what you and you were you were implying, Shane. You know, if you watch the whole show, they need to go into why why he's earned the right to be Batman essentially and take on the mantle and so forth. So it was it was great to see that. Um, I just thought it was, a, it was a solid issue. Again, didn't bowl me over. Uh, again, I, part of the borrow is you, you don't fully know what's going on because you, if you haven't read the previous issues. And again, that's that's when I go back and forth. When, when they do number one issues, and like we were talking about Doom Patrol before, it, it's got to be a tough balance because you, you want to attract new readers, and there, there, are far, there are fewer and fewer of them in comics in general these days. But at the same time, you want to call back to the people who have stuck with the character or the characters all these years. And I can imagine as a writer that, that can be a tough line to walk sometimes. Well, um, go ahead, Shane. And I think some of some of what we're talking about with being left out, not knowing everything that's going on, not mm-hmm. only harkens to the previous Batman Beyond series, which just, of course, ended before this one, but also some of that I think goes back all the way back to that Future's End mm. series that was yeah, going on because yeah, that had was definitely involved in that. A lot to oh, do that's with right. It, that's which, right. How he ended in that gives way to this other character that I mentioned in the beginning of the previous series that just ended. So there, what what ends up happening here with these first number one issues really starts all the way back there in my mind with that Futures End series. I think you could get away with not reading all of that if you just kind of looked up what happened and read that previous series, which I think was only 16 issues or something like that before this Rebirth one started. Uh, but yeah, I, I really think it goes all the way back to there for for this whole story to really start to get to the point where we are in these first two number one issues. And and you know, honestly, I, I, as many people know, I'm a huge fan of continuity and the history, so I, I appreciate that um, very much. Actually, it's just again, also the retail part of my brain. It, it's it's tougher to sell yeah. a, a, a first issue of a comic. If you want to attract the new reader, which which you know comics always desperately needs, when you, you kind of feel like you're kind of thrown into something in the middle, and, and again, it's it's not easy. For, I, I understand from the writing perspective, where, how, again, how you have to try to balance that the history versus uh, trying to, to attract new people to the property. So. Right, because if they went full on with a whole other rebirth origin issue and retold everything, we'd all be complaining that we've already seen this two or three times. Why are we yeah. rehashing it again? We should have something different. So we have something different. It just didn't quite work the way I think, uh, the way I was hoping it would for this Batman Beyond rebirth and first issue. Well, that's why I found the last image of the Joker. I, I actually, Again, I just found it funny because, first of all, he was jacked, which I just I've never searched the Joker with being physically ripped like that, but again, it is the future, and you know they're resurrecting him apparently. Apparently, yeah. um, well, and, and so that that is kind of eyeball rolling. Part of my disdain with that part in particular is I, I love the Joker as a character. I think he's a great Batman foe. Oh, of course, I, I'm. I don't need him in every movie, much like Brian Deemer wouldn't. I don't need him in every single movie, um, but I do like him out there. I don't need him in the Batman Beyond universe. I think for what they did with Batman, the re- Batman Beyond the Return is what I think that movie was called. Oh, Return of the Joker. So good. The Return of the Joker. I, so good. That was really good, and that was a unique way that I did not see coming for bringing the Joker into it. And, and that was creepy. I think that, <laughs> yes, it, it's absolutely <laughs> terrifyingly creepy. And I got a hold of the more adult version of that well before it was released to the populace in a DVD um, and to see that those missing minutes, that that whole scene was just horrific. 
Um, I think that's where that should have ended. I don't think the Joker has a place in Batman Beyond now. I'm fine with the Jokers because they've always been there. Is this especially especially if Bruce thing. is dead too? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd I'd rather see other Batman Beyond foes come in than yeah. worry about the Joker. Yeah. All right. Now, Shane, you have not read Moonshine or no, no. Jessica so Jones, you guys right? go right ahead. I'll sit here and enjoy your discussions. <laughs> And then there were two. And as I said, I'll, you'll get my copy yeah, as soon as we're done talking about it here. Which I appreciate. All right. Uh, yeah, let, let's do Jessica Jones next. You bet. All right. So this is um, – Chris, would you mind going first on this one? Absolutely. I wouldn't mind at all, sir. This is a very strong buy for me. Now, b- before you both talk about it, did you both read the entire Jessica Jones series previously, the previous one? I, yes, I've read everything. Okay. And I have read only like the first four issues, okay. I think. I was just curious. And I have seen the first season of the Netflix series. Which I love that show. Chris, you've seen that too, of course. Oh, absolutely. Amazing. All right. So that's where we stand. Okay. So a very strong buy from Chris and a buy from me as well. Excellent. All right. Now, uh, just the creative team. This is the, this is the creative team that created the character. That's one of the reasons I was so excited to read the book. Brian Michael Bendis. Art by Michael Gatos, color by Matt Hollingsworth, lettering uh, BC's Corey Pettit, uh, and the cover by uh, David Mack. Now, I'm sure we have some listeners have watched the Jessica Jones show on Netflix, which I'm sure was one of the reasons that prompted them to return to the character in terms of her own title and comic form. Uh, that, for me, is one of my favorite Marvel Netflix efforts thus far. And if you enjoyed that, I highly recommend you pick up the original run, which is called Alias, which has been reprinted a couple times in uh, omnibus and softcover form, and then read this. Um, I'm glad we're doing Jessica and Jones and Moonshine last because this is what you get when you have masters working. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, this to me, Jessica Jones is always one of Bendis' greatest properties in terms of characters he's created or put his stamp on. We should recall that Jessica Jones premiered in the very edgy, very adult Marvel Max line uh, back in the 2000s. And for me, that's one of the best finite Marvel series, certainly the past you know couple decades. Uh, I think it's one of the best things Bendis has done in his career. Uh, and I think he carries through with that right off the bat in this first issue. Uh, I don't want to spoil everything about the first Alias series that people have. Have you read Alias, Shane? No, I have not actually. Okay, you should read Alias before you read this. Okay, if you can, if you can. Okay, um, you don't have to, but it, it 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 would just add so much more to your experience of this. Grant, you've also seen the show, so that will help as well. Because mm-hmm. while the show kind of goes in its own direction, it still closely follows the spirit of Alias and of the Jessica Jones character. Uh, but again, I mean, Michael Gatos is a tremendous artist. He 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 really put a stamp on this character he co-created. Uh, Bendis always reminds that Jessica Jones is very much in the Marvel Universe, but because of what's happened in her life, how she's sort of the fallen superhero jewel, and you know the fact that she, she's, she works in sort of the dregs of the Marvel Universe. She's very much a street character, very much in the shadows, in the back alleys, in the periphery. And that this issue very much continues with that theme. We should remind people that uh, at the end of her, sort of her first story arc, which went from Alias to the comic book Pulse, she ends up with Luke Cage. They have a child. And she seems to kind of be settling into that. But then what's great about this book, and it's very much Bendis is having his finger on the pulse this character has created, we see that Jessica's, Jessica's life is in upheaval again. Somehow she and Luke have parted ways. Something's happened with their baby. And you know this is a character who very much is, is in many ways self-destructive, and you saw that in the show, and has a lot of skeletons and demons in her closet. And they're not shying away from that here at all. And... They remind you that Misty Knight shows up. They, they show some of the uh, Avengers in the background. Uh, you know, there's issues with Luke Cage. Uh, and I mean, the, the, sto- the, the last page is, is a confrontation between Luke and Jessica where they're talking about, you know, their baby in a way that's very un- unsettling and troubling. Uh, this is great comics, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, this is, this is a creative team that, again, making their mark on a character they created and taking that character tuning on a journey that is not cozy, that is not you know your snug 
you know, warm and fuzzy superhero comic. This is a, a character who has issues, who is damaged, but it was ultimately heroic, but it's, it's, she struggles in that heroism. She's not, you know, someone who wears it easily. And, uh, I can't. I don't want to spoil too much, but I can't emphasize enough. This is an outstanding first issue, and I'm so thrilled that the creative team that gave Jessica Jones life has returned to her. And uh, I read issue two, and that was fantastic as well. So, highest recommendation for this. Yes, I. <clears throat> my experience with the character cannot match Chris's because, as I said, I've read only like the first couple of issues of the original Alias, which were published 15 whole years oh my ago. God. That's right. Fancy that. But, yeah, you know, I've, I've, I, I, I liked those first few issues. I don't think I would have liked them as much uh, back in 2001. I'm actually uh, – uh, Alias Number 1 is actually uh, slotted to be uh, included on the next episode of the Time Bubble I record. Oh, wow. Whenever that oh! happens. Murd, can't wait for that. All right. Be a pleasure, but it's it won't be until after Christmas. <laughs> understood. To, understood, my friend. Yep, yep. Got to make the sausage first. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Jessica, uh, let, let me ask you something right here uh, first, Chris. Do we, uh, sure. since you're more up on the character than I am, do we yeah. know uh, why Jessica was in prison at the beginning of this issue? No, that's what's that's what's part of the fun. Okay. So. As, as far as I know, we don't, unless I miss some connecting book somewhere else. But Well, I prefer to believe that you're right about that, Chris, and that uh, I'm no more in the dark than anybody else. Uh, because it does open with uh, Jessica Jones in prison. She's released... Uh, for no clear reason. She seems as surprised about it as anybody else. And from there, she just jumps, literally jumps, right back into her old life because uh, the launch that's supposed to take her from the island prison she's on back to shore doesn't show up. So she just, like, swan dives into the harbor and swims to shore where there are a bunch of cops waiting to laugh at her. And then she goes right back to her office and sinks right back into her good old pattern. You know, right? It's, it's almost as if we're back in the early days of Alias, really. She goes back to her office. Um, as Chris mentioned, uh, there are she does have a few uh, uh, phone messages and a few uh, actual visits, in-person visits, from uh, other uh, Marvel Universe denizens. Because, as Chris says, and as I agree, one of the great things about J- Jessica Jones slash Alias is its groundedness in the Marvel Universe. Because in the early days of the Alias series, she uh, was a private investigator doing well, specializing in cases having to do with the, well, the superhuman and the strange. Um, like if you suspect your uh, husband is secretly a mutant or something, you can have her like snoop around in his background. Um, and so here she's a, I, I love the case that Bendis comes up with for her to try and solve because she throws herself <laughs> back into her work. I mean, which is very much in character for Jessica Jones. She's gotten oh, yes. back from her stint in prison and she immediately, she's got all these, uh, pestering phone messages from friends and concerned, uh, uh, acquaintances. And she's also being hectored by, uh, Luke Cage, who's kind of haunting her for this whole issue because apparently she did something with her and Cage's daughter, Danielle. She is nowhere to be – the daughter is nowhere to be seen. Everybody wants to know where she is. Uh, Misty Knight shows up and tries roughing her up a little bit. Uh, I assume it's Carol Danvers. Somebody who introduces herself as Carol is on the – leaves a message on her machine. Yes, they're they're close friends. So Thank you, Chris. So it is uh, the Captain Marvel – Carol Danvers, and uh, she has a little run-in with Jessica Drew, too, who is trying somewhat sloppily to uh, surveil her. Uh, So throughout the issue, um, Cage is making his influence known and uh, is trying to spy on Jessica, find out where their daughter has gone, and by the end of the issue, he shows up in person. Um, but uh, so, uh, but to try to get away from all of this, uh, she just uh, l- l- takes a case immediately. There's a message on her machine, and uh, she meets uh, with this woman uh, somewhere in the city who tells her that apparently her husband uh, believes that he's uh, slipped into the Earth-616 universe from an alternate universe, or at least this is what the wife believes, because he claims to remember being married to a mysterious blonde woman named Gwen – and have a daughter named Norma, as in Norma Osborn. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> this is you know, good uh, classic Marvel Universe parallel uh, alternate reality weirdness. It, it could possibly even tie into the Secret Wars story of last year with you know, these incursions of uh, alternate realities, parallel universes crashing into each other and uh, bleeding into each other in some cases. That's how we ended up with Miles Morales and Spider-Gwen hanging around in the main Marvel Universe. Uh, so maybe this uh, woman's husband is a casualty of all that as well. And so it's a fun idea for something to for Jessica Jones to distract herself from her normal problems with. 
And it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that I enjoyed the most about the, you know, the relatively few uh, issues of Alias that I've read. The fact that she it, – it, Jessica Jones is an interesting character in her own right, but I really liked the fact that she was investigating these other Marvel Universe phenomena. It's kind of like – the early episodes of the X Files, where Mulder, yeah, Mulder and Scully were interesting in their own right, but you liked the cases they were solving more, and the more the show got to be about them, the less cool it was. I'm kind of of that mind too when it comes to Jessica Jones, and it's one of the things I liked less about the. I liked the Netflix series, but I kind of wish the first series had been more about her just solving random episodic cases, and uh, maybe the uh, saved the big confrontation with. Uh, uh, the, the Kilgrave for like season two. Um, uh, this, but in this issue, this first issue of this series, she's getting right back into old habits and uh, her supporting cast is being reestablished. And it, it's all, it, it's, it, it's like old times, I assume. <laughs> you know, old times that I've just recently discovered since I just read the first few wishes of Alias within the last two years. Um, but yeah, I, I, I echo Chris when I say that Michael Gatos is a great artist. And uh, oh, he's yes. gotten much better over the last 15 years, I think. And Brian Michael Bendis, too. I am impressed at how he has grown as a writer as well. He's not as self-indulgent as he used to be. He knows restraint where he didn't used to. He, these characters, it's still rec- the script is still recognizably his style. But the characters aren't uh, going off on weird little circular tangents. They're not repeating themselves <laughs> over and over again. No, no, it's, his scripting has gotten much tighter. It's no less artful. But it's tighter, and it's a marked improvement. I'm happy to see that this series is as good as it is. Um, it's uh, still got that uh, mature feel to it. it. It's definitely still in the, the vein of, uh, of Marvel Max. It says right on the cover, parental advisory, not for kids. So just uh, parents be warned. If you didn't already know, this is not something to give your children. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's well-grounded in the Marvel Universe. It's a uh, return to a great character doing what she does best. She's even wearing a Dazzler Live t-shirt in this thing. It's, <laughs> yeah, so there's another little touch that I liked. So, yeah, Jessica Jones is back, and I'm very happy. This is a buy. Very cool. And I'm handing it off to you, Shane. Cool. Do you mind if I just grab the code? Sure. Grab the issue, grab the code, grab whatever you want. <laughs> All right, our final issue for the evening. Final thing, and we're going to end on another high note here. Uh, oh, God, this is, we are, are we ever. Mm, <laughs> yes, this is Image Comics. It's by the 100 Bullets creative team of Brian Azzarello and, uh, as writer and Eduardo Riso, who is doing he, – he's the artist, you know, just pencils, inks, and colors, all done by him and done very well. And the uh, letters and design, Jared K. Fletcher coming out through Image. Okay, so Moonshine, uh, it's a period piece and a very good one. Uh, it's set uh, about midway – What's your rating? What's your rating, Murd? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's, it's definitely yeah. a buy. Uh, for me, this is the strongest possible buy. Mm. Go ahead, Mer. It is fantastic. Yep. So it's set just about halfway through the Prohibition years in the United States. And, Chris, I'm counting on you to provide some more historical context about that. You as, bet. As we get to it. But it's set in 1929, so Prohibition is in effect, and uh, the mob is more powerful than ever as a result. And uh, it's the story of a uh, sort of a low-level, up-and-coming mob arranger named uh, Lou Perlow, who's sent by his uh, mafia employer uh, down into the wilds of West Virginia to seek out... Um, a very talented distiller who lives up in the woods in the mountains and try and uh, get him to provide his product to uh, Lou Perlow's boss's organization. And uh, while he's down there, he gets a taste of, uh, of mountain hospitality, <laughs> uh, quote unquote, and uh, realizes that something very off is happening down there in the mountains. He doesn't even, at this point, as of the, the end of this first issue, know the full extent of how odd and how wrong things are down there because... It's very strongly hinted that there's a supernatural underpinning to what's happening down in West Virginia on Spine Ridge because uh, yeah, there's uh, the moonshine. The title is not chosen accidentally. There are strong hints that lycanthropy is involved in what's happening here. Uh, so this is uh, too often when the horror and crime genres uh, overlap. Uh, the, the horror is the dominant voice or the dominant flavor in that combination. Not so here. This is much more like a Depression-era crime comic that happens to have possibly some werewolves in it. You know, as I said, we don't really actually see any werewolves. We just see some stuff that uh, makes it seem very likely that werewolves are showing up here. So it's, uh, it's good old boys making moonshine. It's a city slicker criminal wanting to make a name for himself in the mafia coming down to... Uh, get mixed up in their business and there's it's a there's tons of great spooky atmosphere the artwork by riso just oh, sings on every page i mean it's it, it, it's kind of like 
it's kind of like if uh, Tim Sale and uh, Jordi Belair were if you like took both of their hands and grafted them onto Rizzo's <laughs> body because he's 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 providing artwork here that is the best of the the talents of both of those individuals. It, it it's really great looking stuff. It's it, it's evocative. It's it, it's it's quality. It, it it evokes the period. It evokes the setting. Uh, you, you can't ask for anything more. Like the the, the 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 colors show the light of the time of day. You know, you know, the, the sunset in the mountains. The eerie shades of evening in the mountains. By the end of the story, Lou Perlow has found his way to a little uh, encampment of African Americans out there in the mountains, uh, which is kind of a creepy way to end the issue as they're all kind of staring at him and he's just staring back at them and the camp the, the, the color of, of the campfire licking on all the faces the play of light and shadow yeah it's the, the mood is is totally here this it, it's horror it's noir it's crime it is really more the crime and noir than the horror at this point but uh, the, the the promise of the, of the horror is, is is just lingering like a phantasm on the edge of the entire story as it's told <laughs> And there's uh, Herbert Hoover sent some G-men down to investigate, and they meet a bloody end near the beginning of the story. It's it, it's really engaging, and uh, <clears throat> it's it's it, yeah, it, it's worthy of the creative teams. Chris has already said these are masters at work, and uh, let's, let's just say it's a buy for me. And I will now allow Chris to say his piece in greater length. Thank you, brother. I don't know if it's as long as you, because I thought you were masterful in your. Uh, commentary there, but what I will say... I have no doubt that you will eclipse me, Chris. <laughs> First of all, to me, this is the ideal example of how to do a first issue properly. This is, again, it's image, so we know that the creators are fully engaged and invested in this story because uh, they own it, so this is their property, which already right out of the gate, that's always a, bo- a plus. And then when you have... Creators of the caliber of Azarello and, and Rizzo, or uh, forgive me, I mis- probably mispronounced his name. How do you pronounce it, Murd? Uh, Rizzo, I think. Rizzo, okay, thank you. Um, just, you use the word evocative, Murd, and funny enough, that's the word I was going to use to describe this comic, because every element of this, from the use of shadow, which is one of the finest uses of shadow I've seen in a, in a comic book, in, in really in recent memory, just to create atmosphere, to set a tone, um, the way he captures both the voice of, of you know the city slicker uh, mafia underling who's come to you know backwoods West Virginia to find this almost mystical uh, uh, bootleg who apparently pr- produces like some of the greatest you know uh, moonshine anybody's ever tasted uh, the hint of menace in that you don't see the werewolf but they clearly make reference to the fact that something's out there that is supernatural and and not human um but again like any good horror story they don't throw everything in your face right away they leave a lot to your imagination and to your sense of dread uh the atmosphere is wonderful as i said before uh again this is this is right smack dab at the height of prohibition there were prohibition uh the eighth of the amendment was issued uh in 1919 and then it was not repealed until uh, after Roosevelt came in office uh, in the early 1930s. So we're talking about a, a more than a 10-year period where uh, the American underworld made a fortune providing uh, alcohol for uh, the public, especially in urban areas. Uh, we know about the speakeasies, of course, and that whole uh, aspect of prohibition-era culture. Uh, and, and clearly, Azarello has done his homework here, and, 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 and Riso has done his homework. They, they have uh, Joe the Boss Masseria, who is an historical figure. He was one of the uh, heads of one of the, the five mafia families that dominate, especially back then, New York City. He was actually assassinated, I believe, in 1931. Wow, I had no uh, idea I think, he was a real person, Chris. Oh, yeah, he was real. Um, uh, in Coney Island. In fact, if, you're, if any listeners are fans of the, of the great HBO series Boardwalk Empire – with uh, the great Steve Buscemi. You should read this book because it very much has the feel of that prohibition era that you saw on the show, but then it has some supernatural elements in there as well. But but again, it's done seamlessly. It's not like one is overpowering the other and it's done in a blundering fashion because, again, these are master creators. And like we, we talked before about books like uh, you know the, the Mask book and, and Batman Beyond and, and uh, you know Doom Patrol, all number one issues – and we all like them to varying degrees, but this is something on another plane here. This is this is this is comics. This is the art form 
realized again in a way that only I think certain top tier creators can really pull it off to this degree. This this is a brand new concept. It's their property, and I was riveted. For, I mean, I was riveted from the co- look at that cover. I mean, just the atmosphere established by that cover alone knew I, I got me excited about this book. And you, again, they've done their homework. They mentioned J. Edgar Hoover. They make they make a sort of a tawdry reference to the fact that Hoover was most likely a closeted homosexual. Hmm. Which is, you know, become part of sort of his historical story when you read about Hoover, um, and again, they just they they really capture a world where because alcohol because the manufacture, distribution, and sale of alcohol was made illegal in the United States uh, by the federal government through the Eighteenth Amendment and the Volk, uh, what was the Volstead Act? Yes, that's what that's what it was called. The application of the law. And you see how that permeates this world in terms of the business that's being done, uh, the profit motive that's there, what the, the mob is seeking, and, and how the mob is coming into conflict now with these backwards people who they assume are just you know hillbillies they can just take advantage of, but they turn that that sort of that stereotype on its head in that these so-called hillbillies there's a lot more to them than meets the eye. Hmm. And I've already read issue two, which is equally great. And let me tell you something, Murray. When, you, when, we, when we do our awards for 2016, I'm going to have a hell of a time filling out these nominations because there have been so many good books this year wow. that have come out. Um, it's going to be tough because yeah. this is another example of just what a great year 2016 has been for comics. I haven't even begun to think of my nominations, Chris, but yeah, yeah. It, it, it is going to be a bit of a challenge. And that, that's a good thing. So if you're a fan of, of, of 1920s history, the Prohibition era – a fan of horror and, and, and or both, and if, if you loved 100 Bullets and, and you love this creative team, you really owe it to yourself to, to pick up this book. This is yet another example, and I, I proselytize ad nauseum on the show, but damn it, I'm going to keep doing it because Image, once again, is realizing what the comic book medium can achieve because they give the creators freedom. They, they, they allow people to address pretty much any kind of genre you can imagine within the comic book format. And this is another example of how this is knocking it out of the park. Highest possible recommendation for Moonshine number one. My one regret is that I didn't get to read it until well, this morning, the 1st of December, when I really should have been able to read this in October. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so my advice to you guys out there, if you haven't uh, – if you've missed the first couple of issues, maybe wait for the trade. You know, if Image stays true to form, they're probably – probably nine ninety nine. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like the first arc for a very affordable nine ninety nine. Just buy it when it comes out. Put it away. Just like put it up in an oak barrel like a fine bourbon or something <laughs> and take it out again to savor it at Halloween time. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. I know, Shane, you have to leave soon, so just quickly. Any other books we want to talk about that we've been reading? Um, the only thing I've read recently is uh, a couple of the new Justice League, Flash, and Hal Jordan, the Green Lanterns book that DC came out with. Um, I'm enjoying all of those immensely, much more than I care to, because I keep trying to trim that down again to uh, not the bare minimum, but but uh, a, a more costly amount. Um, but yeah, I'm surprised how much I've liked Hal Jordan and the Green Lanterns, and um. I'll keep going with that for a little bit longer. How about you, Murd? I have uh, had well, – I barely got these six comics read for tonight, honestly. I'm pulling a lot of long shifts at the Christmas barn. But right, last you know, night, it's dumb, dumb of me even to pose that query considering your current uh, work status. <laughs> well, not to worry, Chris. Not, I, I actually did – I found time to read something that just wasn't a comic. I reread uh, the uh, J.K. Rowling's Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find oh. Them because the movie is now in theaters. I'm in the middle of trying to read book four finally again. I'm mm. trying to plow my way through that. Well, yeah, Fantastic Beasts doesn't really fit in any specific oh, right. spot in the continuity. You, you could read that right now. Yeah, and, and go see the movie and get mm-hmm. a little bit of Harry Potter yep. verse. Give you a little bit of background into the weird critters you're going to see on the screen. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I, I went to see the movie last night. I'll say this. I really wanted to see more beasts and less of everything else. Okay. But the creature effects were top-notch. Uh, for me, I'm very excited to report that I finally – because the trade came out, I finally read all of the Sugar and Spike stories ah. from DC's Legends of Tomorrow, the miniseries they did. Uh, that was earlier this year, was it not? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have not smiled so broadly and so goofily <laughs> when reading a comic in so long. 
Murd, have you read all these stories? Uh, well, I've at least uh, looked through them. <laughs> okay, Murd, if there's anybody who this book was written oh, for... hell yes. It's you. I, I mean... <laughs> just, he takes, First yeah, of all, the creative team ahead, takes all these weird little oddments of DC history. Like As I've said oh, before, the kind of Murd. things that uh, were included in the ambush bug history of the DC <laughs> universe back in the 80s and just uh, turns them into weird mysteries for Sugar and Spike to investigate. <laughs> First of all, yes, and the art by Bilquis Evely is, is, is sublime. Mm, I mean the yes. art in this is beautiful. Yes. It so perfectly captures the tone because there's – like Sugar has such a sarcastic way about her, and um, you know, this, this is just – the best word to describe this is just fun. I mean this is such a thoroughly fun book, but it's also a very clever book. It's Keith Giffen. He knows his history, and as Bird mentioned, I mean he goes back to some of the classic goofy Silver Age story concepts of many of the iconic characters. I mean who can forget when Superman made an island of himself, for example? They return to that concept uh, in this story. That's just one, one little hint I'll throw there. Um, we talked about when we, we reviewed the first issue several months ago about you know they're trying to get – all of Batman's wacky 1950s costumes from Killer Moth. Uh, that story was great. All the rest are just as good. Um, and what also was also great about it is that Giffen does not ignore the fact that where Sugar and Spike come from, there's actually a very poignant page, because a lot of this is just really good fun, where they have a picture of Sugar and Spike as they were in the Silver Age. And, uh, oh God, was it... Um, was it Shelley Mayer or Moldoff? Who, who did – was it Mayer? I want – I always I, want I to say it's Mayer. Uh, Moldoff, I'm pretty sure, is the one who created Batwoman, but uh, – I think it's Mayer. And Murray, if you could check for what I'm talking. I, but I, am, he, I am. He did Sugar and Spike for years until I think his eyesight went. Um, and he was also, by the way, just for historical purpose, a very important editor in the, in the dawn of the golden age of superheroes, very important figure. Uh, he worked uh, with Gaines and uh, All American. Very, very, I mean, when we talk about historical figures are important and the, sort of the, the dawn of, of the American superhero comic book, his name should be up there. But they have a page where they have a picture of them as they were when they were drawn by Mayer in in the, in the Silver Age, and it's just the grown up Sugar kind of look on her face as she remembers that time. Because there's also like a love hate sort of sexual tension going between the two characters in their adult versions here. This is a feast, this book. And if you love DC Silver Age history, don't think. Buy this immediately. <laughs> um, wow, 2016 has been a great year. And on top of that, to add to my you know, plaudits for the year, I also just read Black Widow by the great Daredevil team of Wade and Samney, the first six issues of that in trade form. I read the first issue, then the rest fell for the track, so I waited for the trade. My god, this team is amazing. The work they did on Daredevil was top notch. They continue that here. Um, the Black Widow again is one of the, I think one of the most compelling characters in the Marvel universe when she's done well. And this is Mark Wade and Chris Samney, so you know damn well this is being done well. And they really explore her history with the Red Room, the consequences of her life, her young life as sort of a programmed assassin uh, for the Soviets. Art is breathtaking. Samney does magnificent uh, hand to hand combat scenes as he did in Daredevil. Again. Uh, to me, Mark, when we talk about master writers in the comic book medium, it doesn't get much better than Mark Wade. The man just is so consistently great in his output, and this is yet another series where I am on – as long as this creative team is doing this book, I'm on board. And if you're a Black Widow fan through the comics and or the films, you will love this because this this is not you know Black Widow like being a super. This is Black Widow being a ruthless spy and trying to deal with – Many aspects of her past, and, and as they mentioned in the movie where she's trying to balance her ledger, and, and they bring that kind of the concept into the book here, and uh, it's extremely well done. So once again, props to two great creative teams and just invigorating such great life into, into, into two great uh, sets of characters. I have shot my bolt. Very good. All right, and all our bolts are similarly shot. <laughs> all right, so I guess the time has come for us to just – Push our chairs back from the banquet table, belt slightly, <laughs> dab at our lips with napkins, and give a final message of thanks to our sponsor for this episode. And that would be the collection drawer company, maker of the drawer box storage system, uh, the uh, classic long box reimagined. For extra accessibility, check them out at collectiondrawer.com. 
Visit us at comicgeekspeak.com to send an email. The address is comicgeekspeak at gmail.com. To leave a voicemail, the number is 267-702-6642. Stop by thecomicforums.vanillaforums.com and let us know what you think of uh, all these titles and our bit of cornucopia comics talk. <laughs> Uh, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook. Thanks to everyone who contributes to the episodes and sticks with us blah, blah, sticks with us year after year. We appreciate it. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time. Laser beams of pain like the seasons on every